Longheads. We know you're listening. This is Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons and monsters and serpents to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, coming to you not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 tangent cube of science, nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed high atop the Edwards Plateau and right next to that Sierra Madera Astro Bleam thing. Yeah. <laughs> this is episode 69 of Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. We are, oh. yeah, we are getting up there, getting real close to episode 72, which I am looking forward to. <laughs> By the way, I, I went back in our f- feed history and found out when the birthday of the podcast is. So we're going to have to celebrate the next time we get to the birthday, which will be like year three. <laughs> so we missed the first one. <laughs> we always miss the first one. Yeah. <laughs> it's like April 10th, I think, was the first. <laughs> so, yeah. Um and by the way, we are joined, as always, by our good friend and longhead compatriot, Mr. Brett England, out there in space. How are you doing, buddy? Doing well, guys. Glad to, uh, glad to be here on a on a Friday. A little bit of a change. Yep. Yeah. Thanks to everyone for waiting again. Totally my fault. <laughs> this is our secondary emergency backup day Friday. Wow. <laughs> Did you get that new transponder? You have not glitched out one time yet. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> could be because he's talking to us from somewhere else in time because he's out in space he's not as deep into the overlapping time cave hole yeah <laughs> all right so we have uh, as always space weather news <laughs> The Draconid meteor outburst, which we talked about last time or the last couple of times. European Skywatchers got a big surprise on the night of October 8th through 9th when a flurry of faint meteors filled the northern sky. It was an outburst of the annual Draconid meteor shower, reports Jure Atakanakov, a member of the International Meteor Organization who witnessed the display over uh, Dolinja Vas, Slovenia. The Draconid Peak is normally weak, numbering no more than five meteors per hour. During the outburst, rates were at least 20 times greater than normal, boosted perhaps by a recent close approach of parent comet 21P Giacobini Zinner. All in all, a rare and impressive event. So, so wait, only one guy, J.O. Takapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapakapak
the robot had live tweeted its own descent to the asteroid. I'm doing it. I'm descending to Ryugu. Can't stop me now. Its engineers posted on an account devoted to mascot. <laughs> Freaking Twitter. Yeah. Twitter bots. <laughs> Damn Twitter bots. Yep. <laughs> it then posted to say it had landed successfully. And then I found myself in a place like no place on Earth, a land full of wonder, mystery, and danger. I landed on asteroid Ryugu. <laughs> it will now spend its time measuring and taking pictures of the surface. It has already successfully collected some 20 images, which are stored on the mothership known as Hayabusa 2, ready to be looked at uh, by scientists. It's freaking yeah. – somebody didn't edit this article. <laughs> The spacecraft went as close to about 50 meters to the asteroid surface to release the box-shaped lander. So That's cool. That's pretty cool. Back that to you, cool. Russ. <laughs> so this one, <clears throat> this story is not Space Weather News, but it is in line with uh, interesting, strange stuff. This happened, uh, let's see, October, uh, on the 9th. Mysterious, eerie hum from a sky lasting 45 minutes with air <laughs> vibrating baffles locals. A mysterious buzzing sound from the sky has baffled locals and left them feeling like the air was vibrating, with residents adding, something strange is going on. <laughs> of course. Uh, a YouTube video, let's see, YouTuber Rene Kripinski shared the bizarre clip, which, which features a low, unusual, fluctuating noise appearing to emanate from the sky in Sweden. The two-minute and 21-second video was reshared by another YouTube channel today. It is the latest in a string of unusual noises to be heard from the sky worldwide, with unusual hums and horrific trumpet sounds. Scientists have been theorizing what is causing this noise from theories ranging from shifting ice to distant storms. Uh, Kropinski shared the video of him standing in a snowy landscape, which is silent apart from a constant low buzz. Uh, let's see. It is briefly interrupted when a snowmobile passes, but once it is gone, the pulsing hum remains. He was standing in an almost empty snow-covered landscape with no obvious source of the ambient sound. Uh, Kropinski described the, chilling, described the chilling sound as coming from the whole sky and said usually the area is extremely quiet. So I've watched the video and it is, it basically is like, there. it's hard to tell on a video, obviously, you know, but there is this weird thrumming hum sound coming out of the sky mm. and he's turning the camera slowly back and forth and you can't, it doesn't, the, the, you know, like I'm listening to it with headphones and you don't hear any kind of change of direction. Uh, it's very interesting. And he is standing in this like desolate landscape. So it's cosmic funk. <laughs> <laughs> like the watcher is just saying, we have buzzing, we have trumpets and booms. <laughs> you put them all together. It's probably a funk band. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's cosmic in size. So it's, we're just hearing like, yeah, really a, a tiny little portion of the the duration of the song. <laughs> Can't get enough of that cosmic funk. <laughs> <laughs> the cosmic funk. <laughs> All right, that's great. Okay, this story made me extremely jealous. Swedish girl skipping stones five finds fifteen hundred year old Viking sword. Ah, uh, I saw that. <laughs> <sighs> if you name your child Saga. You're giving her the burden of explaining its meaning for the rest of her life. <laughs> Fortunately, little eight-year-old Saga Van uh, Vanakek has a tale that most likely beats whatever reason her parents had for bestowing that moniker. <laughs> she found a 1,500-year-old ancient Viking sword in a Swedish lake while looking for stones to skip. Who says kids can't learn from just playing around? She says, I was outside in the water throwing sticks and stones and stuff to see how far they skip, and then I found some kind of stick. I picked it up and was going to drop it back in the water, but it had a handle, and I saw that it was a little bit pointy at the end and all rusty. I held it up in the air, and I said, Daddy, I found a sword! <laughs> <laughs> As the local Sweden reports, her dad, Andy Vanekek, uh, tried to get in on the story, but this saga is all sagas, with a little help from climate change. Earlier this year, the family was spending time at their summer home on this, uh, wow... This Vidostern Lake in Tano, a parish in southern Sweden. The lake was unusually low because of the recent drought, so Saga was able to venture farther out than normal. Saga's saga almost didn't happen because her dad was calling her so he could watch a World Cup match. In fact, he initially thought what she brought back to him to see was either a stick or a toy. <clears throat> And they have a picture of this Viking guy down. Oh, where did I put that sword? <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, Andy showed Saga's sword to a friend who convinced him to take it to the nearby uh, museum, 
where museum official Michael Nordstrom identified it. It's about 85 centimeters long, and there is also preserved wood and metal around it. We are very keen to see the conservation staff do their work and see more details. While initially estimating it to be at least a thousand years old, the museum's analysis now points to the possibility it's from the 5th century CE, or uh, Common Era, which pre- precedes the so-called Viking Age and may even predate the Vikings' ancient Norse ancestors. Further identification and dating is estimated to take at least a year due to the fragility of the sword and its surrounding fragments of wood and leather. Archaeologists are also digging in and around where Saga discovered it for more artifacts and found an ancient brooch from the same period. Uh. To protect the area, archaeologists asked Saga to go against type and not share her saga, which she agreed to, except to her best friend, who Pinky swore to keep the secret until this week. <laughs> <laughs> As expected, the news has people excited about the discovery and about Saga, who some were already referring to as the next queen of Sweden. <laughs> While Saga definitely likes the Vikings, they may be disappointed to find out which ones. The cool thing is, is I'm a huge Minnesota Vikings fan, and this just looks just like a Viking sword. <laughs> That's right. Saga Saga starts in Minnesota, where her family lived until last year. While she apparently likes Sweden, she's still a bigger fan of American football than her dad's World Cup. And the big discovery hasn't convinced her to change her career goals to archaeology. She still wants to be a doctor or a dancer in Paris, not a Viking cheerleader. (laughs) (laughs) Sometimes these articles are goofy. (laughs) Still... This is one of the, you know, this this little girl walking next to the lake. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Let's see. Uh, So there is. okay. this is another this is another current news story. Green gems falling from the sky over the uh, Kilauea volcano. So this is interesting. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it's fascinating. uh, Geology. Some people might say that living in Hawaii is a gift itself. Those people are probably not living in the path of the lava flowing from Kilauea Volcano on the Big Island, which is demolishing everything in its path. (laughs) Those who believe that Kilauea is the home of Pele, the fire goddess of Hawaiian folklore, may blame this on profiteers stealing the volcano's thermal heat or tourists stealing Kilauea's lava rocks. For those people, Pele may be compensating with a gift of her own, green gemstones falling from the sky. Uh... Meteorologist Aaron Jordan lives in Tucson, Arizona, a long way from Hawaii, but she has friends there who sent pictures of the stones, which she tweeted with an explanation that the shiny green crystals are olivine. I think I'm saying that right. A magnesium iron silicate with the formula MG2 plus Fe2. Uh, while it's a gift from Kilauea and Hawaii, those who can't afford a trip there might try Norway, where 50% of the world's industrial olivine is mined. In fact, olivine is a fairly common mineral on and in the ground, but separate large crystals falling from the sky is very unusual. So basically this <clears> the volcano is like blowing these crystals of this stuff out and most of the time when you find it on the ground it's microscopic. Yeah. But these large like pebble sized stones of it are coming out of the sky. <laughs> I remember reading about that a while ago. I guess I, I guess that was when the volcano first started going off. So this is how they say it happens. Popular mechanics reports that the fallen crystals over Kilauea are inside the lava erupting into the sky. As the lava cools it hardens into pumice, that porous rock commonly used as an abrasive. Uh, being full of holes and fairly lightweight, the pumice falls slowly, allowing the olivine crystals to drop out of the holes and fall separately. That's very strange. Before it hardens? No, it hardens into the pumice, and then, and then because it's falling slowly, because it's real light and porous, yeah. the olivine actually drops out of the holes in the pumice because it forms inside of it. Yeah, wow. That's what they're saying. Uh, it sounds crazy. like BS to me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is anybody up there checking, you know, (laughs) but there's a picture of one of them. Yeah. Of course, they might be picking up pieces of pumice. And when you roll them over, some of the olivine crystals like might fall out of some of the holes. Right. But it's just weird that they would form separately inside the pumice in the holes or whatever. I don't know. It's very interesting. So it's, it's also interesting that like. 50% 50% of the world's olivine is mined in Norway or whatever, but now they're falling out of the sky in Hawaii. Yeah. So, uh, let's see. So here's another one in that vein. World's largest geyser is mysteriously erupting a lot lately. <laughs> While the world's eyes are gazing warily at the erupting Kilauea volcano in Hawaii, someone needs to be watching the steamboat geyser in Yellowstone National Park. So this is a Yellowstone deal, right? Yeah. This is another we're about to all die because of the Yellowstone right, supervolcano. Right. But scientists say that all this activity is totally normal. <laughs> right. It does do that in this article. <clears throat> After being dormant since 2014, the world's largest active geyser has suddenly spewed steam skyward uh, for the fifth time in less than two months, and re- researchers cannot explain why. 
Old Faithful gets all of the attention, but Steamboat is in the record books for its 300-foot eruptions that can last up to 40 minutes. To give you an idea of how much water nature's biggest super shooters fire, uh, fires in one blast, the nearby cistern spring is completely drained during one of its eruptions, and it takes a few days to refill. Experts estimate that that's about 70,000 gallons of water. Why is it drained during the eruption? Because it's the source for the water of the geyser. How? I'm not figuring out how that works. <laughs> I don't know. Unlike Old Faithful, Steamboat Geyser is completely unreliable. Until this two-month burst with just days between eruptions, Steamboat has gone from between 32 days and 50 years between eruptions. Hmm. Okay, but recently it has erupted, what did they say, five times in less than two months. That's a lot. Yeah. So the sudden change from unfaithful schedule and long periods between eruptions are what have some experts from the United States Geological Survey looking into steamboat. Not physically. You could put your eye out. (laughs) (laughs) So here here it is from the USGS. Classic. Uh, Steamboat geyser erupts for fifth time in 2018, just before 4 a.m. on May 13th. Steamboat also had frequent eruptions in the 1960s and early 1980s. No implications for volcanic activity, but good implications for viewing some spectacular geysering this summer. (laughs) <laughs> no implications is the same thing they said in February when a swarm of over 200 small earthquakes occurred five miles below Yellowstone National Park during a two-week period in February 2018. And the same thing they said when the supervolcano area was hit by 2,400 earthquakes during the summer of 2017. And you get the idea. The USGS doesn't want to commit because they don't want to start a panic. Yeah. Should we believe the USGS about steamboat? Geysers are caused by surface water seeping downward until it meets hot rocks being heated by magma. The steam in hot water shoots back up through the geyser's narrow sealed pipeline and bursts through the small opening until there's no more pressure to push it out. Steamboat has been known to vent for 48 hours after a major eruption. That's the physics. What this doesn't explain is five major eruptions in a matter of weeks by a geyser that has been known to lie dormant for decades. Is the magma of the supervolcano building? Is it close to the surface? How is it reloading so fast? Why is it reloading so fast? No implications is no answer. Geyser watchers use seismic alarms to notify them when it erupts, which means they miss the initial burst and possibly the entire eruption. Michael Poland, the USGS scientist in charge of the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, understatedly told CNN, The fact that Steamboat has erupted three times in the past six weeks is a bit unusual for this specific geyser. (laughs) A bit. In addition, because of the recent surge, Jamie Farrell, research assistant professor of seismology at the University of Utah and chief seismologist of the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, told this to CNN. We are planning on placing seismometers near Steamboat Geyser within the next week. If it erupts again, it would be nice to be able to record any precursory activity. No implications? We'll see. Hmm. (laughs) I don't understand how they can even say that that there's no implications yeah how do they know they don't don't know they don't they don't seems like a a bullshit thing to say yeah i think i agree with what this guy says that they just don't want to cause a panic yeah like obviously because of the way geysers work this means something has changed right (laughs) (laughs) yeah (laughs) (laughs) yep Okay. Maybe it's FRBs from outer space because <laughs> there's been a lot of those recently, too. Oh, yeah. Do you have an article on that? Uh, yeah. I haven't read it. I haven't vetted it. Okay. And that's it fine. M- might be a bit boring. We are, uh, <laughs> we are very proud of non-vetting articles on, yeah. this, on this podcast. <laughs> yeah. We just see the headline. We're like, I'll read that on the show. Hey, but this is by space.com. <laughs> I mean, space. Dot com. Dot com. Space's website. Yeah. Space does not does not post <laughs> bullshit, boring <laughs> articles on its own website. <laughs> Mysterious deep space flashes. 19 more fast radio bursts found. A huge haul of newfound fast radio bursts, FRBs, may help astronomers finally start to get a handle on these mysterious and powerful blasts from deep space. Didn't they say that the last time there were 13 of them or whatever? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> A new study reports the detection of 19 previously undiscovered FRBs, including the closest one to Earth and the brightest one ever seen. The results boost the total uh, tally significantly. Just three dozen or so FRBs had been previously known, with the first detection coming in 2007. This is crazy to me that it's that recent. Like 2007 was the first time this phenomenon was ever observed. Yeah. I need to look more into it, but 
Uh, FRBs are brief millisecond long, but intense emissions of radio light, which can pack as much energy as our own sun produces over the course of nearly a century. Their source is the topic of much discussion and debate. For example, some researchers have suggested that FRBs could be generated by advanced alien civilizations, though most astronomers favor natural explanations such as fast spinning neutron stars. A new study is led by Ryan Shannon of the Swinburne University of Technology, <laughs> Australia. The tech... Technology in Australia. Okay. <laughs> like the way they spelled it, they didn't put a space between technology and in. Oh, okay. So it's technology. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, his team has been searching the skies for FRBs using the Australian Square Kilometer Array Pathfinder, ASCAP, a network of 36 radio dishes in Western Australia. So... I want to ask you a question, but I haven't finished reading this article. Okay. Uh, anyway, I'll just finish it. The systemic hunt has already turned up 20 FRBs. The researchers report in a new paper, which was published online today, October 10th, in the journal Nature. One of the bursts they spotted was reported previously in a different paper, so the count of newfound FRBs technically stands at 19. The team's success rate can be traced to two factors. Um, The telescope has a whopping field of view of 30 square degrees, 100 times larger than the full moon. Wow. And by using the telescope's dish antennas in a radical way, with each pointing at a different part of the sky, we observed 240 square degrees all at once, about 1,000 times the area of the full moon, he added. Wow. ASCAP uh, is astoundingly good for this work. Uh, the team's analysis show that fast radio bursts are coming from the other side of the universe rather than from our own galactic neighborhood. The researchers did turn up the nearest known FRB to Earth, an event known as FRB 171020, which originated about 425 million light years away from our planet. That's about twice as close as the previous r record holder. And the ASCAP survey has discovered the most powerful FRB known, again, by a factor of two. Said Shannon, who is the uh, main researcher, who's also affiliated with the Australian Research Council Center of Excellence for Gravitational Wave Discovery. <laughs> <laughs> this is just crazy. So what's the question? <clears throat> um, well, I was wondering, like... So they're using radio telescopes to find them, right? Yeah. But you've been talking about how since we invented radio telescopes, there's just all this data. Yeah. That nothing – like we don't have the – really the computate the – Yeah. We have all this data power. and then they go, they go digging through it to look Looking for, for things that they – they're picking what to look for, right? Yes. They're not just looking for anything. Right. So this is too much data. Isn't it possible that ever since we invented radio telescopes, they've been picking up FRBs and oh, we just yeah. don't – that it's just somewhere in the data. Yes, that's okay. usually what when you when you when you read about people finding new FRBs is because they've been digging through past data. So they go and they 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 take the blah 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 you know the whatever survey from some radio telescope array and they start digging through the data looking for FRB uh, signatures. Yeah, uh, that's usually what. And the reason why we the reason why the, they're so recently discovered is because they're radio bursts. Like radio telescopes haven't been around that long. <clears throat> yeah, well that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. The the watcher is asking if it's ASCAP as in A S S C A P. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> it's A S K A P. <laughs> so uh there I read the whole thing in the beginning here. <laughs> ASCAP. Yeah. Other uh, other possible acronym butt plug. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Australian Square Kilometer Array Pathfinder. Okay. Ass cap. <laughs> so he's posted up, uh, he's posted information on olivine here. I want to read it. Olivine has a very high crystallization temperature compared to other minerals. That makes it one of the very first minerals to crystallize from magma. During the slow cooling of magma, Crystals of olivine may form and then settle to the bottom of the magma chamber because of their relatively high density. Olivine has a temp temperature of crystallization in excess of uh, 1,200 degrees Celsius, which is stupid high. So it seems like the crystals formed in cooling magma then got kicked out in a burst from the volcano. 
Yeah. So they're actually already formed. Right. This, this explains why they're falling out of the pumice rocks. They're already formed and they're floating in the magma itself. Right. And the volcano spits it out. That stuff forms into pumice and then the, the crystals of all of you fall out of the pumice. Yeah. That makes sense. Pumice. Pumice. How do you say that? Pumice? <laughs> Pumice. Pumice. <laughs> uh, so the last time I reported on Fast Radio Burst was when they found the repeater. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Fast Radio Burst. 121, 102. Uh, so th- I just I forgot about this, but um, so there's only one repeater that has been confirmed. And it's this one, FRB 121, 102 which has fired off bursts multiple times since its 2012 discovery, including a barrage of at least nine, at least 93 over the course of a single day in August. Wow. 2017. Right. And that was the one we were talking about that makes it seem like they can't be catastrophic events. Right. They were thinking that it was like, yeah, well, obviously it's the center of a galaxy exploding and imploding. (laughs) (laughs) I did read an article about a, uh, what they called an orphan GRB. <clears throat> a gamma ray burst. Yeah. Uh, and it was orphan because it had all the signatures of a gamma ray burst, but there were no gamma rays that they, de- that they, that they detected. Yeah. So that was interesting. Looks like chicken. <laughs> Tastes like chicken. <laughs> <laughs> all right. This is an article that basically confirms something I've thought for a very long time. New research on the theory that octopuses are aliens. Oh, yeah. Well, that's obvious. <laughs> the controversial theory that mysterious and biologically complex octopus, that the mysterious and biologically complex octopus is so unique that it had to come from another planet, just got a scientific paper backing it. And they quote here, quote, thus the possibility that cryopreserved squid and or octopus eggs arrived in icy bolides several hundred million years ago should not be discounted as that would be a, par- a parsimonious cosmic explanation for the octopus's sudden emergence on the Earth circa tw- 270 million years ago, unquote. Okay. Should not be discounted is not exactly a bet your life savings on it endorsement, but it's still a big deal. It's ki- kind of a big deal. In a paper co- entitled Cause of Cambrian Explosion, Terrestrial or Cosmic, published in the Progress in Biophysics and Molecular Biology Journal, 33 scientists researching the cause of, of course it's 33, Researching the cause of the Cambrian explosion, the mysterious point in Earth's history when single-cell organisms were suddenly overshadowed by complex animals, linked the panspermia or cosmic cause to the equally mysterious and sudden appearance of octopuses. (laughs) (laughs) Quote, the transformative genes leading to the consensus ancestral nautilus, to the common cuttlefish to squid, to the common... uh, let's see, are not easily to be found in any pre-existing life form. It is plausible then to suggest that they seem to be borrowed from a far distant quote unquote future in terms of terrestrial evolution or more realistically from the cosmos at large. One plausible explanation in our view is that the new genes are likely new extraterrestrial imports to earth, most plausibly as an already coherent group of functioning genes within say a cryopreserved matrix protected fertilized octopus eggs. So cryopreserved and matrix protected sounds like a Superman origin story with creatures sent by another civilization to populate the galaxy. (laughs) (laughs) But the paper leans more towards the idea that Earth received a bombardment of comets and asteroids that could have been carrying organisms that somehow managed to survive the cold, the radiation and the long trip. Only a complex species could devise a way to do this. An advanced species with a really big brain like octopuses. Yes, that seems to be the flying octopus in the panspermian ointment in this particular paper. It singles out octopuses as an, as an or possibly only, uh, advanced species that sent preserved eggs during the same period that it speculates asteroids and comets were involuntarily bringing other hardy cells and viruses in mass to ignite the Cambrian explosion some 540 million years ago. Octopi or octopuses? No, octopuses is actually the correct, yeah. Octopi is a pseudo-Latin, that's what they say. I looked it up. Hmm. It's octopuses. Octopi is like pseudo Latin. It's not real. (laughs) (laughs) Pseudo Latin. But it's the same thing, yeah. Okay. This speculates because there's no physical proof, yet the cause of the Cambrian explosion, uh, there's no physical proof yet of the real cause of the Cambrian explosion. So panspermia, climate change, evolution, and others are in play. Uh, Octopuses are a special and highly unusual species that can edit their own RNA and slow down their evolution, a process that science cannot explain yet. 
It's interesting that many scientists think the idea of intentional panspermia as their origin on Earth should not be discounted. Does this mean octopuses are aliens? We don't know. That is cool. I didn't know they could edit their own RNA. I didn't either. What do we got here? I'm just... The I'm standard English plural of octopus that. is octopuses. However, the word octopus comes from Greek, and the Greek plural form is octopodes. Modern usage of octopodes is so infrequent that many people mistakenly create the er- erroneous plural form octopi, formed according to the rules for Latin plurals. <laughs> Yeah. Octopodes. But, nah, I don't know, man. <laughs> it's a, it's pseudus Latinus. <laughs> I like octopodes better than octopuses. That's for sure. Yeah. Octopodes are cool. Yeah. So basically what we're saying Dude, here is I'm trying to figure out how they're Cephas. doing this. They're like, they're like, Hey bro, do you have root? Are you rooted? <laughs> what? <laughs> like octopuses are rooted. <laughs> so they can freaking just like open Ed, up their their, oh, edit like their own RNA. editor <laughs> yeah. and just like change it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's fucking cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, how are they doing this really? Like, yeah. <laughs> is it because they have eight Set, arms? Set a DNA change equals zero. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> comma 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 change dot lol <laughs> equals yeah <laughs> set sepha kill all humans equals one. <laughs> <coughs> all right, it, so uh, it, I have lots of articles here. It kind of makes sense. We're out of time. Well, I mean, we're not out. Of, oh, okay, uh, yeah, we can no, take, a take a break. Yeah, but it kind of makes sense that they can edit their 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 RNA or something because they can edit. Like everything about themselves, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They can make themselves completely saying. look totally different. Yeah. I got gotcha. you. Uh, yeah. So there could be there could be octopodes walking around on the on the surface looking just like humans. Yeah, like in destroy all humans. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Maybe that's what the men in black are. <laughs> You know, they're octopodes yeah. like they, that's why they look so strange. And the, it, the, and the reason why they the you know, they have the they don't have any hair, you know, the whole men in black yeah. thing. They have no eyebrows or whatever. And they have these really big eyes. It's, they're actually octopodes. The, the suits are actually part of their skin. They're, yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> All right. We're going to take a quick break and we'll come back and talk more about snakes. Tongues, <laughs> <laughs> slithering snippets, snake bites, <laughs> snake bites, <laughs> a well-rounded breakfast for all serpents, <laughs> tidbits of info about space, and aliens, <laughs> <laughs> and Cephas. <laughs> So before we get into, uh, I've got a bunch of other articles to read, and then we're going <clears> to <throat> get into some other discussions. I've got some listener emails to go through. The first one is from The Stash. Okay. If you guys haven't been disappeared yet after the Antarctica es- episode, I have a question for you. <laughs> <laughs> after immensely enjoying the interview with Clinton Beckham and reading about the eight-year-old Swedish girl who stepped on a pre-Viking sword in a lake last week, I was wondering if any of the buried points or knives have been tested for ancient DNA. <clears throat> if we have the capability to pull traces of DNA off of murder weapons long discarded, what kind of impossible, impossible monster stuff might be found on a paleo artifact? That is a great idea. That is a great idea. Thanks for some great shows. The stash PS. Did you know that the rock and roll hall of fame in Cleveland, Ohio was a pyramid? Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> they knew what's going on. That's right. 
That is a great question, Stash. I don't know. Um, most of the time, DNA falls apart really fast. Yeah, but, uh, uh, well, a cave point, you know. Yeah, a might cave have point preserved in ash. If they stabbed something with it and then they brought it back to the cave. Yeah. Oh. Um, the Watcher. The Watcher is eating? Yeah. <laughs> I accidentally hit the button on my keyboard. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> How's that uh, MRE, buddy? <laughs> Pretty good. Space spaghetti all the way. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Another e- uh, listener emails. Awesome podcast and book suggestion from Aaron Hurst. Hey, guys. Thanks for making such a fantastic show. You guys have one of the very best podcasts out there seeking to make sense of the ancient stuff and how it relates to the world we live in today. You always keep the big picture in mind and pull from so many disciplines. Your speculation is refreshing, refreshingly uninhibited and intelligent or entertaining. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not both. <Bob. laughs> it's either intel- intelligent. The first part, she was talking about you. The <laughs> second part, I think it might have been about me. <laughs> I've listened to all the episodes and now eagerly await each new one. I have recently stumbled across something that I think you guys might like. Have you checked out the work of, uh, I don't know how to say this name, Jano, J-N-O, Cook? And she gives a link here. Um, Over the last decade, he's been attempting to build a working chronology and explanation of history based on a literal literal interpretation of mythology and the examination of plasma science and electric universe ideas. He is a true skeptic, a thinker, a theorist, and with refreshing ideas. His entire work is free to read online. Uh, or you can have your phone read it to you, Kyle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or you can buy the print version. I'm halfway through volume one of the print version. I am totally <laughs> blown away with the, by the ideas he presents and the way he combines things from so many disciplines. Anyway, I just thought I'd send you a thumbs up and let you guys know about Jano's work. It, Jano, I don't know how to say it. If you haven't found it already, cheers, Aaron. Dude, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm going to get that. Speculation dude's. is refreshingly uninhibited and intelligent or entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get uh, Cook's stuff on my phone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I've been not really listening to anything because, well, I did get a new phone. Oh, yeah. So. You got a new phone. Yeah. Okay, so this is from uh, Sydney, England. This is the father of the Watcher. <laughs> <laughs> so we got a, we got a whole bunch of emails from him. He was the Fallen. <laughs> That's right. He was one of the Fallen. <laughs> one of the Fallen. <laughs> <laughs> and he nicely itemizes his stuff here. So he says, one, there was a quant stuff in the first Planet of the Apes movie. The remaining humans lived underground and worshipped a nuclear missile on an altar. Ah. Really cool. Um, let's see. <clears throat> If a butt flap is a pelt from an animal, they kilt it. (laughs) (laughs) It's a kilt. (laughs) And then he says Van Daniken. Von Daniken is Swiss, as is George Sukalos and Billy Mayer, for that matter. So, yeah, we were saying he was Austrian or German, but he's Swiss. Sorry there, Daniken. They're all the same, Swiss, Germans. And looks like your dad is showing you up, Watcher. But now I know where you get it. (laughs) Your ability to watch. (laughs) <laughs> he also says uh, like and this is talking about the dream that i had with the with where there was this enormous like bunker shelter beneath the house where i didn't want to grab the handles because they were metal yeah he says if you actually build the shelter just remember to insulate the handles <laughs> 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 that's good advice thanks <laughs> <laughs> and he says i've been forgetting to compliment kyle on all the wonderful <laughs> variations on a theme of your break music so creative so precise in their frame are there a, is the, are they a song or are they available on one of your cds uh, they are a bunch of different songs and no, they are not available on any CD, but ever since I heard that comment, I'm thinking that I should make an album out of them and release them, but I'm constantly making more. <laughs> so i once I get to a, a good album size, just make digital releases of each song. It's more expensive. Oh, if I do a, if I do, um, like if I actually publish it as an album, it's way cheaper than publishing each one individually. Oh, okay. So if I get, you know, get a good chunk of them, maybe on our next birthday. Yeah. Okay. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> next, next podcast birthday. Maybe I'll, I'll do a, uh, a Hobbit birthday present. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and the last thing I want to thank you. Yeah. 
Yeah, re- really appreciate that. That was that's cool. Yeah, Kyle that's does awesome. work really hard on the music and and the um, all the uh, all the intros and outros and the way that it's timed and everything is really awesome. Yeah, so there are, there some of them I do take snippets of the same song. Like I'll often be searching for a place in a song that I've never used before. Yeah. Uh, so it is true that different ones are Piece, actually different pieces, pieces of, of the same, same song, song. but yeah. it's each, but there each, are multiple songs in the repertoire. Right. Each, each bumper is basically a minute long, 30 seconds and then 30 seconds of fade out. So I pick different minutes in different songs, but some of the songs are like nine minutes long. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, stalactite. Yeah. yeah. So anyway. Yeah. And the last thing I was going to read from his emails, he says, I play solitaire while listening to you. I just hit game number 32,500 with a 13% win ratio. (laughs) Holy crap. I want to know if your win ratio is going up ever since you've been listening to the podcast (laughs) due to 30% brain expansion. Yeah. (laughs) And don't forget to use retro causality. Yeah, that's right. If you like just focus on the game afterwards (laughs) to make sure that you won when you were playing it before. Or something like that. <laughs> <coughs> I have to apologize for the uh, congestion, coughing, and wheezing. But I have been inundated by some thing that is making my <laughs> immune system think that I'm being attacked by something <laughs> that I'm not. In other words, I'm having an allergic reaction to something going on around here. <laughs> it's been happening for about a week. So apologies for all the noise. Okay, the other thing I wanted to point out, I'm not going to read these, but, well, maybe I'll read one of them. Let's see. Uh, Let's see here. Brenner, a listener Brenner, and you guys have heard him on the show, has decided that he's going to post his own uh, descriptions of the shows. (laughs) And he's been doing this in the comments, (laughs) and they are fantastic. Uh, So you can go check out the comments on the shows and see Brenner's alternate descriptions. (laughs) That he posts underneath mine. So in Antarctica and the Breakaway Civilization, episode 66, I said, In this episode, we take a deep dive beneath the Antarctic ice into a conspiracy-laden rabbit hole of UFOs, ancient aliens, ruins of a lost civilization, World War II-era German nationalist breakaway civilizations, geopolitics, the airship sightings mystery, abductions, contactees, Project Blue Book, and much more. That's my description. Brenner says... In this episode, Russ seamlessly weaves together an eschload of seemingly unrelated data points, pulls the cork on his brain, and releases a complex wave of brain power into a microphone. (laughs) (laughs) So if you want to see Brenner's alternate descriptions, go check out the comments on the website. (laughs) They're awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for that, Brenner. That's really cool. It's been making me laugh. Um, Okay. So I want to read this article We've talked about this briefly, but this is this article has a bunch of information about this. It's really, really fascinating to me. The mir- mysterious ancient walls of California. You remember this this topic? Mm, no. In the eastern reaches of the greater San Francisco Bay Area, California, is the region most commonly called the East Bay, which comprises the eastern shores of the San Francisco Bay and San Pablo Bay, the city of Oakland, communities in Alameda and Contra Costa counties and the larger cities of Fremont, Hayward, Concord, Berkeley, Richmond, and Walnut Creek. It is a fast-growing, populous region, but it is not without its share of strange mysteries, and one of the more intriguing of these is a series of enigmatic walls sprawled out in the hills with origins shrouded in mystery and lost to the mists of time. The walls, often referred collectively as often referred to collectively as the Berkeley Mystery Wall, meander over 50 miles through the hills surrounding the East Bay area, snaking along from Berkeley to San Jose and passing through various state parks, including the Ed R. Levin County Park in Santa Clara County, Tilden Regional Park in Orlando, uh, Orinda, and Mission Peak Regional Preserve in Alameda County, as well as private ranches in the Livermore Valley. And they are a common sight for hikers in the area. The walls themselves range anywhere from a foot or two high all the way up to five feet in height, with an average of three or four feet, and are composed of rocks of varying sizes, mostly coarse-grained sandstone, ranging from softball-sized stones all the way up to massive boulders weighing several tons, all stacked with precision but not using any type of mortar. They are very old-looking, sunken deep into the earth, covered with a layer of lichen, overgrown with weeds, and obviously ancient. There's a picture of one of them <clears throat> going across the tops of a hill. Yeah, that's cool. The trajectories of these walls are sporadic in nature at best, sometimes stretching for many miles, sometimes only for short stretches, and they can go perfectly straight or twist around in snake-like patterns or even they spiral. 
Some are out in the open for no apparent reason, while others run up against boulders or are situated in inaccessible areas where it is hard, it is hard to imagine anyone wanting to build a wall for no apparent purpose in the first place. And this is one of the enigmas, that they don't seem to have any use for anything. None of them are enclosed, and they are too low to be effective as a way to keep in horses or livestock, and they do not seem as if they would be much use as defensive positions either. Making it all the more bizarre is that some of the walls end at mysterious stone circles up to 30 feet in diameter. Their purpose is just as inscrutable as the walls that lead to them. The strangest thing of all is that it is completely unclear as to just who built these walls and for what reasons, and it is still unknown how old they are. There is no written documentation of the wall's construction, and pretty much the only thing known for sure is that the early Spanish explorers in the region reported that they were already there when they arrived. Of course, with such a mystery and lack of any clues as to the origin of these walls, there has been much speculation about them over the years, ranging from the plausible to the more outlandish. There's another good picture of one. Wow. One of the first ideas as to the origins of the mystery walls was proposed in 1904 by a UC Berkeley professor of Oriental languages and literature named John Fryer, who was convinced that they had been erected by ancient Chinese or Mongolian explorers that had arrived in the area before the earliest known European settlers. That's what? <laughs> <laughs> for what? <laughs> Well, the only people I know to build a wall are the Chinese. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, they built a giant wall in China. They'll probably <laughs> build one here, too. That's just, that's just, come on. You got no creativity. <laughs> this is intriguing, but unfortunately, there is no other real evidence whatsoever to suggest that ancient Chinese explorers were ever in the East Bay area in pre-Columbian times. Other ideas were that these were erected by the native tribes of the area or by early European explorers or missionaries for purposes unknown, although many researchers at the time believed the walls to predate the Spaniards or even the natives. A more far-out theory is that the walls were built by an advanced lost civilization from the legendary continent of Lemuria, once proposed as being the true origin of the human race, or settlers from another supposed lost continent called Mu. According to proponents, proponents of this idea, the displaced populations of these submerged continents spread out across the globe and in this case made their way to the East Bay area where they erected their walls. The problem is that there is no real evidence to support this, nor even of the existence of these quite possibly mythical content continents in the first place. <clears throat> now, perhaps more rational theory is that the walls are not as old as we have been long led to believe. Research into the lichen covering the walls have suggested that they were quite possibly built between the 1850s to 1880s, which is far from pre-Columbian times, and an era, era in which there were many ranchers in the area and had a steady influx of settlers. While this method of dating the walls is not totally accurate, this theory suppo uh, supposes that these were walls erected for the purpose of guiding cattle, delineating property, or catching drain water, possibly by Native American, Chinese, or Mexican laborers at the time. Right, which is why they would make a circle <laughs> at the end of one of the walls. <laughs> right. The, yeah, problem with all, the problem with all of these is that people are supposing the walls had some purpose that we usually use walls for, like holding things in. or Right. And, and none of it, the spiral Has anyone... I'm still waiting for a point in the article where they're like, somebody tried to compare them to astronomical figures or blah, 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 and no. it's not happening yet. No. Nope. But I'm waiting. Keep going. It doesn't say that. I'm ever. not going to talk shit yet. <laughs> <laughs> However, a true and definitive answer has continued to elude us, and the walls remain just as cloaked in mystery as they always have been. With archaeologist Mark Hilkema <clears> of <throat> the Santa Cruz District of California State Park saying of them, there is no definitive answer to, on its origins, which further delights the public who can take it to new levels of speculation. As with many such mysterious structures, we are left with an unsolved puzzle, fuel, fuel for speculation and debate, but offering few real concrete answers. A location etched in time as an anomaly, possibly forevermore. We are left <clears throat> still asking who built these walls and for what purpose. Why are they so unevenly built and what are the circles they lead to? Although most of the walls skirt some of the most rapidly growing and highly populated areas in, areas in California, we still don't know the answers to these questions, and the puzzling mystery walls of the East Bay continue to elude clear understanding. It's interesting that this archaeologist has the view that archaeologists not having an answer for it delights the public <laughs> because it allows them to speculate. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of cool. Yeah. Except that even when you do Except have answers. Except that you can tell he's being condescending about yeah, it. Yeah, I know. But even when you do have answers, bro. I still speculate. Right. Because. <laughs> yeah. It also shows you like, like uh, a reason why they want to come up with answers to stop people speculating on stuff. If they think that way, right, then they'll have this. Outlandish ideas. Right. Uh, yeah. All sorts of outlandish and far out, far reaching ideas. <laughs> Not one of which had anything to do with space. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> 
Somebody could try to think. Maybe it was the Mongols trying to keep the Chinese away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it was a bunch of lemurs who were. Yeah. It was people trying to keep lemmings from jumping off the cliffs. <laughs> the Lemurians or whatever they are called. <laughs> the lemurs. <laughs> <clears throat> <clears throat> All right. That's really cool. Okay, so real quick yep. before we move on. Um, uh, Smith Farm in Vermont. Yeah. Same deal. Like, right. Walls were going everywhere. And, of course, I don't know how over how many square miles or whatever. Yeah, that, 50 miles of those walls yeah. in there. But very large area, um, which is now a state park, which used to all be – or it's, it's not a state park. It's just – yeah, it was a state natural state area. owned land or yeah. whatever. Um, these walls and mounds, they're just like mounds, large mounds, small mounds, some mounds that were like, you know, the size of a bathtub. Yeah. And then some were enormous. Yeah. The size of a house and like stacked up against massive boulders, you yeah. know, that were sticking out of the mountain mountainside. Sides. And then some of the mounds would have just walls, like the the ones in this fo- in those photos, yeah. just running out, and they would go straight. Sometimes they would snake like curve. Sometimes there would be they would encircle something. Yep. Sometimes there would be li- little like little mounds or tower like things, not towers, but you know parts that were stacked up tall. Yeah. Along the wall. Yeah, like uh, little like little towers in on little the wall. tiny mounds, yeah. towers or whatever s- steep mounds. Um, there's even one that has that that they built over top of a a stream. Yeah, so the the wall like snakes around, but but at the end it's like the water's coming out like the, the mouth of, the of a serpent or yeah. whatever. Yeah, I don't know. That was awesome. <clears throat> so. Uh, you know, and it wasn't the settlers doing that. Right. I don't think. I don't think. But And some people think that some of those walls are ley line related, earth line, telluric mm. current related in some way. Yeah. I mean, who knows? I don't know. But uh, it's it's interesting that pe- – that, I mean, I know in Vermont, it's like everybody just kind of thinks like, oh. Yeah, these were old settlers that built this just stuff. Just like – yeah. Yeah. So nobody really takes an interest now. When we were there, the guy said that some university like Yeah. Harvard student? Not in Harvard. It was some I can't remember. It was some <clears throat> university that at least had people who were interested in yeah, that. Yeah, he stuff told us it was controversial. Yeah, and they were they were sending a team out to like, you know, take a look at him, but um the public in in general, I guess, just doesn't really have an interest because They've sort of been decided as to what they are. Right. Even though the academics know that they don't really know what it is. Right. So they're sending a team out to like really check them out. Right. But, but the public has taken the idea that the authorities all think that they're colonial. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, it's just strange that they're not mapped. Now, in Vermont, there's that huge canopy, so you can't just walk around with a GPS. You yeah, we You literally <laughs> have to survey it. Yeah. Uh, which would take a team maybe years. Yeah, and it's all in, in like up and down steep mountainsides and stuff. So, yeah. <clears throat> But out there in California, it's probably – Yeah, those were open fields. Yeah, a lot of them were open fields. It would be interesting to, to draw it out on a map. Yeah. All okay. right. Okay. So this is, a, this is a topic that has been – a favorite of mine for a while. I've I've always wondered what is on, going on with this. This is called the mystery of the ancient eternal flames, and we've talked about this. The ever burning yeah. lamps. Back through the fog of time, our ancestors had mysteries that even now we can only begin to guess at. In many cases, these mysteries take the form of strange, almost mythical advancements, technology, or discoveries that these ancients may have taken for granted, but for which we are left striving for answers. Surely such one bizarre anomaly upon the pages of history as that of the supposed flames that never go out, which cannot be extinguished by earthly means, and the secrets of, secrets of which remain lost in the past. The existence of the mysterious lamps that can supposedly burn for centuries, millennia, or more, perhaps even eternally without any human intervention, has been mentioned since far back in history from many parts of the world, from such tales particularly prevalent from Egypt, 
It was believed by the Egyptians that the dead required some source of light to guide them to the underworld, as well as to keep away evil spirits that would try and hinder their journey or harm them. And to this end, the ancient Egyptians were said to have routinely sealed up some sort of lamp or light source within tombs. But archaeologists and Egyptologists agree that there is no evidence for open flame sources, as no residue or scorch marks have been found within these darkened chambers that would point to, point to traditional torches. So how did they do it? How did they provide this illumination in the dark? One theory says that these ancient people found a way to harness the technology to produce eternal lights that could burn indefinitely without any discernible fuel source, which was said to be the realm of the power of the gods in which they managed to learn the secrets to. What have come to be collectively known as ever-burning lamps have been described since ancient times and have been written of by many writers and explorers throughout the ages. <clears throat> In 100 BC, there is an account scrawled upon papyrus and later described by the Arab philosopher uh, Iambicillus. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Iamb Iamblichus, which tells of an expedition of explorers who sought access to the underground chambers beneath Giza and during their adventure came across these eternal flames. According to the report, <laughs> it said, <clears throat> We came to a chamber. When we entered, it became automatically illuminated by uh, light from a tube being the height of one man's hand. And thin, standing vertically in the corner. As we approached the tube, it shone brighter. The slaves were scared and ran away in the direction from which we had come. When I touched it, it went out. We made every effort to get the tube to glow again, but it would no longer provide light. In some chambers, the light tubes worked and in others they did not. We broke open one of the tubes and it bled beads of silver-colored liquid that ran fastly around the floor until they disappeared between the cracks. Mercury? Yeah. As time went on, the light tubes gradually began to fail, and the priests removed them and stored them in an underground vault they spe uh, specially built southeast of the plateau. It was their belief that the light tubes were created by their beloved Emotep, who would someday return to make them work once again. Such tales of these eternal lamps continued throughout the ages from various disparate places. The Greek biographer and essayist Plutarch once wrote of an ever-burning lamp situated over the entrance to the Temple of Jupiter Ammon in Egypt which he claimed was unable to be extinguished by wind, rain, or any other force, and which the priests of the temple had claimed had burned steadily for centuries since time unremembered. The Temple of Apollo at uh, Cyrene and the Great Temple of Aderbane in Armenia were said to have similar ever-burning ever eternal lamps. The classical Greek writer, uh, let's see, Pausanias, also wrote of a lamp kept at the Temple of Minerva Polius in Athens that could remain burning for years without refueling. During Roman times, there were many accounts of such ever-burning lamps as well. The second king of Rome, Numa Pompilus, supposedly created a light source that could burn forever, which, we, which he had sealed within a temple dedicated to an elemental spirit. Interestingly, Numa has long been rumored to have found a way to use electricity long before that was even a thing, although what truth this has, no one knows. There was also a lamp found at the tomb of Pallas, a uh, son of King Evander in 140 AD, which had, according to a legend, burned for more than 2,000 years on a mysterious mix of gel-like material within it, and was apparently unable to be extinguished by any normal means. In 527 AD, there was a discovery made by Roman soldiers loyal to Emperor Justinian as they were in Syria. According to their account, they found the lamp situated over an ancient gateway, and that it bore an inscription saying that it had been lit 500 years before. Another early Roman account of the ever-burning lamps was given by early Christian theologian and philosopher St. Augustine, who mentioned such a light in an Egyptian temple dedicated to Venus, which he believed to have been fashioned by the devil himself. According to St. Augustine, this flame could not be put out by any means ordinary man possessed, and he was convinced it was fueled by dark ancient magic. Indeed, this was a common go-to explanation for oddities back in those times. Later centuries would bring numerous other accounts of these seemingly impossible lamps, and in the 16th century, there were several discoveries. During the papacy of Paul III in 1540, there was found in the tomb of the daughter of the great Cicero, uh, which had been sealed in 44 BC, but which was found to contain a light which had been burning for uh, 1550 years, but which quickly went out when it was hit by the air. In 1534, King Henry VIII plundered the alleged tomb of Constantinius Chlorus, the father of the great Emperor Constantine, which supposedly held a flame that had been constantly burning for 1,200 years. And in 1580, the Spanish scholar uh, Juan Luis Vives uh, wrote of an ever-burning lamp that had been burning for 1,500 years and which disintegrated into pieces of dust when it touched, when it was touched. The 17th century, there is also a tale of a young Swiss soldier named Dupraz who stumbled across a tomb 
in France, which supposedly had one of these perpetual lamps burning bright within. The soldier then allegedly took the lamp and brought it to a remote monastery where baffled monks examined it and de- deemed it to be a marvel. It was then kept there, burning away as it always had been, before one mo- monk purportedly accidentally broke it before its secrets could be revealed. Interestingly, there were many other reports of these lamps being sealed within tombs all over the world, including India, China, South America, North America, Egypt, Greece, Italy, the United Kingdom, Ireland, France, and others, which were still illuminating the murk when the tombs were opened, keeping the blackness at bay, but many of which were seemingly extinguished with with exposure to air. In many cases, the mysterious fuel within the lamps was found to be perfectly preserved and usable even after so much time had passed. And that these lamps were almost always ensconced within circular vessels seemingly designed to protect the everlasting light within. This habit of going out upon being found could have been due to some unknown chemical reaction or may have been a way for the ancient architects of these devices to keep the formula secret. This would have made sense since the ability to craft a lamp and fuel that could burn indefinitely without any maintenance would have been a jealously guarded secret. They may have gone through great lengths to make sure the formula never fell into the enemy hands by basically engineering it to self-destruct under the right conditions or through other measures. There is one very harrowing account from the 17th century in England, which apparently had some sort of ancient robot guarding the lamp secrets. In this bizarre account, the supposed tomb of Rosicrucian founder Christian Rosencruz was opened to find an ever-burning lamp suspended from the ceiling, shining bright as day after over a millennia since the tomb had been sealed. According to the report, one of the explorers purportedly stepped on a stone, which brought to life a massive suit of armor, which lurched forward not to attack the one who triggered the trap, but rather to mechanically demolish the lamp with an iron sword. (laughs) (laughs) I think I remember hearing that one. Yeah. The idea of an eternally burning fuel source was much discussed in past ages, especially in medieval times. And it was controversial to say the least. For some, this was clearly the work of the devil or of some dark mystic arts but others were more willing to try to get to the bottom of the mystery. It has been uh, thought by some that perhaps these were very early instances of the use of electricity, although there is little little evidence to support this. There are some stories. One was written of by the occultist uh, Eliphas Levi in his work uh, History History de la Magie, who wrote of a 13th century French rabbi and advisor to the court of Louis IX. Uh, This mysterious... uh, Jeshiel supposedly had an enigmatic device in his possession which looked to be a glass globe which could go on burning without any source of fuel and use no wick. He also had apparently rigged up some sort of electrical current to his door knocker, (laughs) as it was written. (laughs) When he touched a nail driven into the wall of his study, a crackling bluish spark immediately leapt forth. Woe to anyone who touched the iron knocker at that moment. He would bend double, scream as if he had been burned, and then he would run away as fast as his legs could carry him. (laughs) 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 The ultimate do not disturb. (laughs) Yeah. There is also the idea that there is really some ancient formula for an ever-burning fuel source that has been lost to time. If this were the case, it is uncertain how it would work, but there are ideas. For instance, it is thought that they might have utilized wicks manufactured of some special material such as asbestos or other ingredients, which was a pursuit of alchemists at the time and called salamander's wool. And there were also several alchemical recipes published for ever-burning fuel, such as the formula written of in H.P. Blavatsky's work Isis Unveiled. Or it could have been some other equally clever and innovative ancient technology that we have lost, some ingenuity of the ancients that has been buried in time. In the end, in modern terms, the idea of a flame that can burn forever without a constant fuel source is seen as scientifically impossible and perhaps not a little ridiculous. In our current knowledge, it is just not possible. Fires are not infinite, and we cannot constantly and indefinitely provide the heat, fuel, and oxidizing agent fire requires, and yet these cases span far back into time. Not helping matters at all is that there is no physical evidence whatsoever of the various supposed ever-burning lamps that have been found throughout history, leaving us without anything concrete to prove any of it. It seems more plausible that these are mere myths and legends, but maybe there was something our ancestors knew that we don't, some secret knowledge hidden out there which we may never find. In the meantime, it is a fascinating thing to ponder all the same. Impossible lamps! Yeah, I I don't like the the sort of... the kind of... uh, perpetual motion fallacy that he uses at the end there. No one's talking about it burning forever. 1500 years is not till the end of time. (laughs) Yeah. You know, he's saying like science says that there's nothing that can burn forever with no fuel source. Well, it's not forever. By the way, uh, the sun. Anyway, (laughs) have you looked up recently (coughs) during the day? (laughs) Yeah. That's a good, it wouldn't need, it wouldn't need to actually be burning. 
um, it could be using some other electromagnetic fields right. will illuminate certain gases. Right. So. And I mean, there's clearly in that that earliest legend of the of the catacombs beneath the Giza, they were talking about mercury in tubes. The tube broke, and he says right. the silvery liquid came out. Right. There are there is mercury vapor yeah. in in modern day. Uh, fluorescent bulbs so and another another interesting thing about modern day fluorescent bulbs is often touching them will make them flicker and kind of not work anymore yeah yeah exactly <laughs> it can do both right like there was nothing we could do to get it lit up again well try touching it again <laughs> try it just real fast yeah. just a tiny little bit maybe turn it back and forth a little bit yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> shake it up and down sometimes you just really gotta like almost touch it right touch yeah. something else metal nearby so there was something I read recently. I can't remember where it was, but uh, it was and it was a it was a document talking about this. It was some alchemical document I was looking at, and the guy was saying he was he basically it was a sort of an aside comment that there was a fuel that was possible to make that would make that would burn for millennia. Not he didn't say forever, but that one could make a lamp that would burn for hundreds or even thousands of years using fat. From fishmen is what he said. Hmm. The fishmen. Yeah. The guys in the bath suits. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I took it to mean. Fishmen. Oh, okay. It could be, yeah, it could be Oannes. It could be a it could be a uh like some kind of I don't know, like a like a coded hint. I was just thinking of that the carvings, you know, with the guy that is just basically wearing the big bass right. and his face is on the side of it. <laughs> right. <laughs> and his legs are coming out the tail. Yeah, that's <laughs> Oannes. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So it could be a code to say that, like, you get this, you get the fuel from these beings that live beneath the sea. Yeah, that's also going to be in our um, product line on the Snake Bros store, by the way. <laughs> uh, a giant Oannes suit. <laughs> yeah. It's just a big fish. <laughs> And you can wear it on Halloween. Right. That's all you need. <laughs> your head comes out of the mouth yeah. and your legs stick down below the tail. Yeah. And you hold a lamp that burns forever. <laughs> Who are you? Oh, honest. <laughs> Obviously. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I am one of the Opkalu. Good grief. <laughs> But I'm I'm fascinated by this idea, you know, it's very Indiana Jones of like going into some ancient place and there's a light source in there. Yeah. And like you open it up and you know that no one's been in there for however long it's been in there and you open it up and yet there's this thing burning or lighting the place up still after thousands of years. Yeah. I think that's cool too. Yeah. Ever burning lamps. But – it doesn't seem so implausible to me because of the all, all you know the ideas about these sort of earthworks that were in tune with the planet and yeah. uh, all these different forces of the earth the way they built things that you know we look at it today and we're like wow it has all these interesting mathematical principles in there but you know doesn't look like they had those principles yet, but that yet their buildings reflect right. that they might have. Well, maybe <clears throat> they arrived at their at those principles by something else that they noticed in terms of the energy on the planet or whatever, and they were building these things to focus energy. And like, like what if there were sort of like clairvoyant people? at the time that could sort of feel or they were sensitive to these types yeah. of energies and everything. So they, that's how they, or maybe they had a, you know, a whole uh, order of people that were sensitive to that stuff. And that's how they arrived at these building methods Yeah, that ultimately embody like these universal principles, these universal uh, constants or whatever, like fee and, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So it's like maybe they didn't have that as an individual concept, but they they figured it out through these through other means. You see what I'm saying? Yes, I do. Yeah. Um. So anyway, that type of stuff is is cool to me. I think that that's possible that some ancient builders 
were concerned with those types of things and they were using these energy for these earth forces or whatever you would call them. And so really the idea, the idea that the, the specific types of rock and all this kind of stuff that they used and then whatever their technology was, was utilizing those, what we would call subtle energies today. Cause like yeah. right now we're like mining all this crap and enriching it or whatever, yeah. or, or refining it to where it's like, yeah, don't, you know, don't smoke around that. Bro. Right. It's going to explode. <laughs> yeah. Like they didn't use stuff like that. Maybe, right. Perhaps. Yeah. They're, they, they, so in other words, they didn't need like right now, the light bulbs that we have, these gas lamps uh, or, or uh, fluorescent bulbs that we have, they won't run off of very subtle electromagnetic currents or, or fields right. or, yeah. or whatever, because we have a 60 hertz, 120 volt system. Yeah. Why would you try to build shit like that? Right. But, but you could. Yeah, you could. You could build something that would illuminate. Now, it might not get, you might not have like extremely bright, high focus light like we get out of these little freaking spaghetti. Right. But in a, in a pitch black tunnel yeah it would be br- it would be great It'd yeah be like exactly. a glow stick a glow yeah, stick yeah. is subtle energy it's not going to explode in your hand that's right right you crack it open and it'll burn for hours yeah and it's 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 dim in a normal room with yeah. regular light but if you're in a tunnel and you don't have anything else yeah. it's it's going to save your freaking life i mean you you know they they had phosphorus yeah right that's like you can't you can't have agriculture without phosphorus. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? They had to have, like they had it, but yeah. maybe they didn't, maybe they refined it. Yeah. Maybe they didn't. We don't know. Yeah. But, but aren't there, there, there are like, uh, you can also refine chemicals. phosphorus from urine. I mean, like, yeah, yeah. There are chemical marks and stuff inside the pyramid of like weird, of weird chemicals, chemicals yeah. like that. I can't remember what they are, but. The other thing that's interesting about the legend, and this is this I find fascinating because this guy couldn't have known this when he wrote this, that the, the original one with the tubes beneath Giza, when they got closer to it, it got brighter. Now, if it was operating on some subtle electrical energy, a huge group of people emitting all their own EKG, whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. signatures is going to make it get bright. Okay, also... And then he shorts it out when he touches it. <coughs> that's what I was going to say, is that... A lot of these stories can't contain like, oh, well, they, they started tinkering with it. They're checking it out and then it goes out. Mm-hmm. Well, it, it's just like if you're using subtle energies, then you're going to have a very, very delicate there's a balance. balance. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. You guys walked in with all your freaking wool shirts <laughs> and just screwed up the freaking balance in here and the lights went out. Right. <laughs> like, no, dude, you have to be wearing you have to you have to wear silk and, a, and an amber headband. Yeah. And it says the slaves got scared and all ran away. And I'm like, no, you guys were so focused on this. The slaves are like, now's our chance. Let's get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're going to take another break and we'll come back for the second half of the show and continue this line of, of discussion a little bit and maybe uh, go on to some other topics. the explosion <laughs> life life, life. <laughs> hold up, hold up. <laughs> having more fun than Enlil allows human beings to have this is his brother the serpent podcast <laughs> <laughs> that jerk <laughs> ai be praised ai be praised <laughs> so I wanted to talk about crop circles and stone circles a little bit here. I've been thinking about this recently. And 
whatever you think of crop circles, like it's it's obvious just from a a brief perusal of Google images that many of them are now um, quite obviously man-made. But there nevertheless remains quite a few every year that cannot be easily attributed to human beings. Um, most people, skeptics, will attempt to, but there are some that just are difficult to explain in terms of human beings pushing down crops using boards and strings. Now, I don't deny that even some of the more complex crop circle designs can be, could be, uh, built by humans. Yeah, especially now with, like, GPS-guided tractors. Yes, right. (laughs) The problem is, is that the farmers themselves are not doing it. And it's difficult to get a GPS guided tractor out into somebody else's field in the middle of the night. (laughs) (laughs) And the other thing is, is that this is, it's always done during the harvest season. Okay. So it's the, the period at which crop circles appear in crops is the period at which in, at least in England, this is where most of them appear in the, in the area of England, and this is on the Sarsen Plain, okay? So remember that the area where most of them appear in England generally are around the, 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 the places of Stonehenge and Avebury, okay? Very ancient, uh, <clears throat> what are considered to be st- uh, Stone Age and, and Neolithic landscapes. The whole landscape, even though now a lot of it's crop fields, the entire landscape was at one point completely worked over by ancient peoples, mm-hmm. Okay. So the landscapes that we see now, like Stonehenge itself is considered to be an archaeological landscape, not just the, the, the standing stones, right. but everything around it for as far as you can see has completely been worked over by people in, yeah. the, in ancient times. Uh, and there's interesting correlations with that and some of the mounds and mound builder stuff that was found here in the United States. But getting back to crop circles – the period in which they appear are when the crops are almost ready to harvest, which means the You're that destroying period. destroying them. Yeah. yeah. It, they're, well, this is the interesting thing. The ones that are made by human beings, the crops are killed because they're yeah. pushed down and they're broken or whatever. There are ones where the crops don't die. Okay. Hmm. So you have to really – they they have to be examined very carefully and it has to be examined before a ton of people go in there and, and start laying down to absorb <laughs> right. Gaia's energy. <laughs> yeah. uh, You'll like, see plenty of pictures of people like spread eagled in the middle of the freaking yeah, yeah, just getting a bunch of freaking chiggers <laughs> all over them. <laughs> <laughs> they won't discover for twenty four hours. <laughs> That's right. But in the in the studies that have been done on ones that are mysterious, first of all, they appear in less than four hours, because, again, the time period that this happens in the UK, the nighttime is very short. This is during the summer. OK, and the UK is far enough north that the nighttime is drastically affected during this period. OK, so mm. during the summer, the nighttime is a lot shorter than the daytime. So you only have a, sh- a short period of darkness. OK, so you have roughly between four to six hours to do this and you have to do it in complete silence with no lights. Okay, it's very difficult to explain. The other interesting thing about the crop circles that are not that are that are more difficult to explain is that, like I said, the crops aren't killed. They are they've been they're not killed. (laughs) (laughs) They've been folded over, but not crushed. Yeah. Okay. the ones that are made by people using boards and strings and stuff like that are crushed because people are pushing a piece of wood through the crops and breaking the stalks. Mm -hmm. But. There are crop circles that are made where the stalks are bent over and the node at which they were bent over has been a, a, has been subjected to some kind of heat to allow it to bend without killing it. Mm. Right? Like, like the spot heat right at the ground level that warms the crop up and allows it to fold over without breaking it. Mm. And you can actually see this, that people take pictures of these crop circles later on and the crops have started to grow up again from their folded over position. They've turned back up towards the sky and it started to grow again. Okay. The other thing that they've found is in the soil beneath the crop circle, as opposed to the soil outside of the crop circle in these more mysterious ones, the soil shows an application of extreme heat right on the upper, right on the upper, like the upper surface of it. 
right? Mm. Right on the top surface. Like, so there's some kind of strange thing happening here that results in like heat affecting the crop at the ground level, which also affects the soil. And then it swirls the crop down in this like very, it's, it's a very strange like patterning. Okay. You can see it. All the crops are going down in a swirl, but they're, they're overlaid with each other, almost like they're, they're woven together. Mm-hmm. Whereas the ones that have been pushed down by somebody pushing a board doesn't look like that at all. Yeah, just... It may have a spiral pattern because they started from the middle and they're going, they're working their way outwards bigger and bigger, but all the crops are just crushed in a, in a spiral yeah. pattern. Whereas the ones that are not like that, it isn't, a, it isn't pushed over in a spiral pattern. They're actually woven mm-hmm. across each other and they, they, they make this mat, you know, that isn't easily, ach- I mean, you can't, I mean, you'd have to sit there and weave it basically by yeah. hand. Okay. So I'm fascinated by the fact that these things appear around these ancient landscapes. So in the places where these crop circles appear in great numbers, there are also, in a lot of cases, known ancient structures that are also circular with lots of little circles around them, right? Like Stonehenge, like Avebury. Like these dudes were seeing it back then and they built stone representations of it. Exactly. (laughs) That's freaking cool. Oh, man. (laughs) But the other thing I'm thinking of is like if you look at the stone circles, like what is causing this, this, the the crop circles? If if they are – if they are some kind of – like we were talking about before with the ever-burning lamps, there's some sort of subtle energy thing happening here. Okay. Yeah. A a lot of times they look to me like – like some sort of cymatic pattern is taking place. Maybe it's FRBs. (laughs) It could be cosmic origin. you know, there's more power than our sun puts out in a whole year and one FRB, man. Right. Exactly. <laughs> it's just like, like, hey, did has there been 20 crop circles that just appeared recently? <laughs> like, they just found 20 FRBs. <laughs> <laughs> it totally could be something cosmic in origin. What's also interesting to me is that generally, oh, yeah, so the watcher's put, posting a picture of some of the woven... Like, how would you do that with a board and ropes? Yeah, that looks weird. But this is the thing that I'm talking about. Like, uh, is there some connection with this? And the other thing is, like, these places like Avebury, they have these huge, like, mounds. And they have spirals all over them and everything. Like, it looks like... Yeah, like they were... Experiencing the same thing, yes. Now, one possibility... Is that 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 these stone circles and other things are actually recording spots on the planet where this stuff happens, right? So not only not only are the stone circles astronomical in purpose, like we know that the ancients when they built things, they didn't just have one purpose, right? Yeah. It may have been a place for people to be buried. It also is a place for people to look at the stars and calculate things. It was also a thing that sort of reflected the as above, so below whole yeah. mathematical deal. But it also might have been recording Earth's subtle energies. Yeah. Right. Places that are I mean, this is why people go in the middle of crop circles and lay down like there's something special about the spot. It's a sacred place. It induces visions. It induces healing like this. I'm just telling you what I've read, about. I've never been to a crop circle. But people some people swear up and down that going and laying in the middle of a crop circle can cause can have healing effects. Maybe the Druids like really did find some weird, you know, other world. They were crossing, they were crossers, you know, like yeah. crossing through into other worlds or maybe, you know, maybe it's like. Yeah. What, what would an overlapping time cave hole look like if it opened up in the middle of a crop, yeah, circle, no, in a crop no, field, no, you know, would it leave this crazy? I don't know. Go on Google images and look up crop circle and you probably <laughs> find one. <laughs> it could look something like what you might think it would look like. <laughs> right. So the point is, is like, I, I, I. I wonder what would happen if you – what would happen to a person who was standing in the spot where a crop circle began to form? Like that's never happened they as far as I know. a chapter in 411. That's right. 411. That's right. <laughs> they would disappear. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> 
I mean, if Star Trek was going to be like authentic, anytime they got beamed down to the planet and they had grass or whatever, they should form crop circles around them, right? <laughs> yeah. They're all <laughs> crop circles. Dude, just that would be freaking awesome. <laughs> That'd be a great like addition for any of you Hollywood uh, producers that obviously listen to our show. <laughs> Next uh, sci-fi movie. Yeah. You know what to do. When people get beamed down from the spaceship <clears throat> into a field of grass, crop circles should form around each person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or if they get beamed out, same deal. Crop circles should form. <laughs> That's right. But <clears throat> the idea that I'm talking about, like one of the things I was thinking of was like these stone circles. They're all different. Like no two are the same. Right. What, what if they were recording some sort of cymatic type pattern on the surface of the earth of subtle energies that are in the planet itself or cosmic in origin or whatever? Yeah. Or tapping into it. Right. In some way. Ta- like, like this is what I was going to ask you. Like if you had a the, the Chaladni plate, right. And you had this constant uh, frequency going to it that, that waxed and waned in terms of strength, but didn't change frequency. Could you strengthen it by putting certain... Well, you could focus it, yeah, for sure. I mean... By putting certain uprights around it in, in node points. Yeah, or where, however you position them, it's going to change th- the pattern. Yeah. Right? So you could strategically position them to create a specific pattern somewhere. Right. And and this, the uprights would then pick up the vibration, too... Right, I mean, and they create something. They become part of the system. Yeah. So, like, depending on how you design it, yeah, you could you could make it that way, like where they absorb vibration or uh, redirect it. Yeah. Redirect the energy somewhere else. Yeah. Or something. And this may be why the ancients were very specific about the stone types that they used. Yeah. Like the all the stones. The blue stones at, at Stonehenge ring when you hit them. I mean, they're already frequency. They already have a high frequency response. Yeah. So could they have actually been like first noticing and then manipulating some kind of subtle earth energy <clears throat> with these? Sure. I think so. And the you know the 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 Stonehenge the the, the Sarsen and Avebury Plains or whatever that where all these things appear is obviously powerful in this sort of thing because there's so many crop circles there every year. <clears throat> yeah. It's also interesting to me that over time crop circles have slowly become more complex. Yeah, I know. A lot of skirptards uh, claim that that proves that it's humans doing it. Yeah. Well, I mean that. They're just like, obviously, we're just getting better at it. Right. right? The hoaxers are getting better <laughs> yeah. at their hoaxes. <laughs> and I think that they are. Uh, the people yeah. that make them are getting better at it. But nevertheless, there are these unexplained crop circles that are also getting more complex over time. And I wonder if that's because, I, I don't know. Like, Well, it's also like our cameras are getting better. We're getting better drones. We're getting drones. Yeah. Um we got planes. We had satellites at 1.2. And right. before all that, we didn't have any of that shit. <laughs> yeah. So how do you know how badass the crop circles were? <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> true. <laughs> I mean, we're just talking about, you know, since we had all these things to capture and the more, like how many people had a, had a video camera when right. we were kids? Not yeah. many, you know, compared yeah. to today, everybody has one. Right. But it is a it is a fact, nevertheless, that as you go back in time, the crop circles, the pictures of them, even even just in the brief period of time where people have been recording them with video and images, have gotten less complex. And yeah. I wonder if that is a reflection of the increasing complexity of our own effect on the subtle energies of the Earth using all of our electromagnetic okay, stuff. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. What like if we're running more cycle? power lines everywhere, and we're building we're 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 building things that that change the vibrations of the Earth and the and the so just like with cymatics. Um, a, a higher frequency tone will build a more complex image. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So what if it's just a cycle? It could be I'm a cycle. It. it could be a cycle. Lower frequency makes a simple image. The higher frequency you get, the more complex the image gets. Right. So you and it may go up and like, it may, it may, they may start to get more and more simple again. Exactly. Yeah. You got this sawtooth, you know, waveform or not a waveform really. It's it, it, if you graphed it out, it'd be like 
sawtooth where the frequency graph it out is in getting, terms of complexity. Yeah, it's getting higher and higher and higher, and then it drops to the bottom and gets higher and higher and higher. Right, or it may bottom, go up and go down, yeah, and may exactly. go up and go down. Yeah. So it'd be interesting to see like how <coughs> how much more complex they get, and do they begin to sort of drop off in complexity and go back down to being very right. simple circles, and then they begin to go back up, and that'll tell us something. Right. But it. Th- my point was simply. And if we go knock down all the stone hinges, will they just get real simple again? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I earth, don't know. The earth energies are like, dang, they're back to butt flaps, guys. All right, make it, make it simple. <laughs> but yeah, I, th- I thought that this is, <clears throat> there's something there with the, with, with, with crop circles themselves. And it's a, it's a fascinating subject, but uh, I still believe that I still believe that there are some of them that are not that are not explainable in terms of people pushing boards and ropes through the crops. And this is a this is a fact that the that over over time over the past three decades or so I, I don't, don't quote me directly on the time, but the people that that mainstreamers have trotted forward as the people who are the hoaxers have in turn been shown to be hoaxing the fact that they hoaxed all this stuff. Yeah. Right. The whole Doug and Dave deal, like those two guys who claimed that people were saying, Oh yeah, these guys were doing all the crop circles. Well, it was shown like not too long, not too long after they did this, that there was, it was impossible for these two old guys to have done all the crop circles that showed up everywhere. Yeah. One real easy way to find out, murder them. <laughs> <laughs> and see if we have any more crop circles. <laughs> Just coming up with solutions here, guys. Yeah. If we want no, to, but here's a side we note. want to like, really be empirical about whether or not crop circles are being hoaxed, murder all the hoaxers, and then see if any crop circles show up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Snake breads. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so on a, this is sort of a side note, but. You know, there are some people find it extremely hard to believe that, you know, there are these deep conspiracies where, yeah, for years and years and years, like, you know, the government's been keeping this secret, man. Like, yeah, how can, how could they have possibly kept that secret? Yeah. For all those years, you know, now this is yeah. just, uh, blah, blah, blah. It's just coincidence. It's coincidence. But then the same people are like, these, there's just these guys that are making these crop circles and <laughs> right. they've been like totally letting aliens take credit for it for all these years. And they're getting ridiculously badass and they're not claiming credit for their work. <laughs> right. And yeah. nobody that they, nobody's discovered them. Right. Nobody has ever had, outed them. None of their friends. They've never bragged about it at a bar. Right. Yep. And it's just been this massive conspiracy all this time. Right. Yeah. And the government can keep secrets. The Manhattan Project. Yeah. Had thousands and thousands of people involved in it. I know that was a k- kind of a bad way to explain that, but you know what I mean? Like yeah, the, I know. The, the people that sort of skirp derp, just trying to get those terms straight, skirp derp, <laughs> the idea that there could be these like elaborate conspiracies that have been yeah. going on for a hundred years. Yeah, or they will turn around and, and use one to explain <laughs> something that they don't like. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they're not making any money off of it. Right. It's a huge conspiracy to not make any money. (laughs) And to keep it secret for years and years and years. Right. No bragging rights whatsoever. Uh, uh, Just make sure my epitaph says, made all the crop circles. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, they were just getting like... They were just getting like laughs out of just just between the two of them getting laughs at like all these people who believed that aliens were making the crop right. circles. They weren't laughing around anybody else because people were like, what are you laughing at? <laughs> nope. Yeah. Yeah. And th- like I said, those guys, the classic Doug and Dave duo who was were trotted out by the BBC, I think the BBC did a whole thing on how they were the they were the ones making the crop circles that was later shown that, th- that they were actually hoaxing that they were hoaxers. Mm. You know, wow, that's that's uh. yeah, it was a, it was a it was an attempt at an explanation that just didn't fly. But people still refer to it. Oh, those were all made by those two guys, you know, in their 60s or whatever. Pensioners that didn't have a job that went out there every night and now they're in their freaking 80s or something. And there's still tons of crop circles appearing everywhere. And just yeah. like, uh, I don't think so. So, yeah. 
And I mean, did they fly to the United States and make the crop circles that appear here? You know, the crop circles aren't just there in England. They're, they're, they appear elsewhere in the yeah. world. So, uh, and the, I mean, there is the earliest, the, the, I think the earliest recorded one is like the whole, the, the devil plowing or whatever. There's an old, there's an old uh, newspaper article and they had a woodcut, you know, of this guy who, I can't remember what it was, but he pissed everybody off and he, he couldn't get any help to, help to, to plow his crops. And then like, they went out there and found this giant circle that had been plowed in his field. And they said that the devil did it because nobody else would help him. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> and they had this woodcut. What a nice guy. This, that like, devil. devil plowing a circle in his field or whatever, <laughs> <laughs> or reaping, reaping the crops in a circle. <laughs> But I do think it's fascinating that there is some kind of connection between these these Stone Age and Neolithic landscapes and crop circles appearing in profusion. So that's something to look into if you're interested in it. I had a we had a good friend who um, suffered from time to time from um, sleep paralysis. And he was afraid that one day he would wake up and there would be crop circles in his beard. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> like all, if you look at it with a magnifying glass, all of the hairs in your beard are just laid down. They're not cut. <laughs> right. And that was because the aliens showed up and put crop circles in your beard while you're in sleep paralysis. <laughs> They're all woven together. It's, it's expressing some mathematical formula. <coughs> yeah. If I was ever going to get a tattoo, it'd probably be a crop circle. I think that'd be bad. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right on my forehead. <laughs> 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 All right. So That's what cool. was the what was the podcast you were going to complain about? OK, Let's so I actually plugged this podcast on this podcast. Uh, it's the the Mindscape podcast with with the um, uh, Sean Carroll physicist guy oh, yeah. Yeah. interviewing people. Well, he's interviewing this this woman who uh, is a science fiction writer. OK. And so they were talking about. Uh, just this idea of writing science fiction. And I was just like getting all worked up <laughs> because, and, and you don't have to tell me if this is true, but okay. there's this idea that science fiction writers are sort of like futurists, uh-huh. you know, yeah. or, or they're one of the things he was calling them was like, they're, they're the last generalists of hmm. our time. They, they just they have a general knowledge of like everything okay. pretty much. Right. Yeah. Um, they're except for people cause they're nerds. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like Larry and Ivan, his characters were always the same. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was just a way they were describing them, but they're talking about how, well, you can't have science fiction writers using faster than light travel anymore. I mean, come on. Ugh. We know that's impossible. Oh my God. And so science fiction writers have a, a duty you know, to know the science, this is what made them so great, you know, the greatest ones, because they really knew the science and yeah. then they were able to like sort of predict where it was going, where it could possibly go with, with the science of the times. Yeah. Right. And I was just thinking, I'm listening to this guy, Sean Carroll, this physicist, <laughs> and I'm just like, how arrogant. Yeah. Is that idea that like these science fiction writers, these people who are creative coming up with ideas are supposed to like just because you believe that this is impossible. Right. Yeah. Like they are supposed to uh, get rid of it. Not. Yeah. Not use, use it, it ever. Yeah. Ever. Or come up with some way that it could be possible. Yeah. Uh, but then in the other hand, he like. He, he actually recommended somebody, well, you just, you have to have a wormhole for that. You might as well use it. <laughs> <laughs> and so he like gave, he gave this chick like the, the idea that like, well, wormholes are really possible. I mean, they're not, <laughs> they're not quite right, but, but you're going to have to have one for that part. So you might as well just use yeah. it. But uh, I would say that that's, that it's, that in some cases it's true that sci- like there's a, there's two <laughs> different kinds of science fiction, <clears throat> right? There's the, what they call hard science fiction which is people who are looking at current or or very like very new science 
like a lot of my favorite science fiction stories, they're short stories, and you could tell when you're reading it that the guy who wrote it was reading the current like periodicals or whatever of right. and found out that they just found out about this new object in space. And then he wrote a short story based on everything that they could f- think of about this object and then put people around it and, yeah. and, and put them into some situation. And they're usually a short story is almost always it has a single problem, you know, and the person who is involved in it, like encounters this new mysterious object and goes through this issue of trying to figure out what the hell is going on because of this object that he's encountering in space. Right. Yeah. Like a classic one is, <clears throat> Is neutron star. So right after neutron stars were first theorized based on current astronomy, Larry Niven writes this story. And he first of all, he puts the guy – he's like, OK, it's a neutron star. He wants the person in the story to go and make one orbit around the star. OK. And he puts them in an indestructible hole because you can't really actually orbit really close to a neutron star without – being destroyed. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he's like, at first they have an indestructible ship hole. It's completely transparent so that you can see through it unless you paint over it or whatever. But it's totally indestructible. It's a monomolecule is what he said. The whole thing is a single molecule, so it can't be destroyed yeah. unless you tear the entire molecule apart. Right? Right. And like the mystery in the story was that the person who was being sent out to go around the thing was being paid a ton of money by the people who built the hulls. By the company who built the holes because they had already sent somebody out and it destroyed them. The ship came back and the people were just completely destroyed on the inside. Like somehow it reached through the ship and completely destroyed the people on the inside without damaging the ship at all. Right. And they were like, well, we want to send you out there to figure out what happened. And they offer him like this ungodly sum of money. And he's like, "Okay." (laughs) (laughs) And of course, the answer is the tides. Right. As he gets extremely close, the gravity gradient is so high that on one end of the ship, it's be, you're being pulled very differently uh, than on the other end yeah, of the ship. Yeah, so it just rips you apart. Yeah. Right. And so he, like, at the last second figures out that he's got to crawl to the very center of the ship and, like, hold on to the – he's actually holding on to the, uh, to the drive, which is in the middle of the ship. And he's holding on to it, and he can feel his fingers being pulled one way and his toes being pulled in the other way. And he's like, oh, God! And then it, <laughs> but, of course, the orbit's really quick, and he gets slung out from it going some ridiculous speed. That kind of story is badass, right? It's taking current science – and sort of extrapolating on it and putting people in a situation where they're about to die because of this thing, right? Yeah. <clears throat> but like a larger science fiction story, like th- some authors will use current science or the things that science says are impossible in or- as, a, as, a, as a story device. Like the fact that we can't travel faster than the speed of light and so everything is incredibly far away in terms of time, right? But people who are traveling there don't experience the time – so they're using the Einstein, right, 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 right. So it only takes you four years to get there in ship's time, but by the time you get there, thousands of years have passed for the rest of the universe. Yeah. So that's a good story device for people who are writing an interesting story about anywhere you try to go, you're going to get there thousands of years later, even though it only takes you five years to travel. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> but if you don't want to have that problem in your universe, then people have come up with ways for people to get around it, and there's never, they're never breaking the rules. They always go around them, which is what most science does. You know, yeah. you find out that you, that this is impossible to do or whatever, and then somebody finds a way to just ignore that rule. There's some other set right. of rules that we can use to go around Quantum that entanglement rule. or whatever, right? right? Exactly. Like, let, me, let me just build myself on the other side of the universe. Right. So a classic – yeah, exactly. <laughs> a classic one is the, the concept of hyperspace, right? Hyperspace meaning – that it isn't space that we live in where speed of light is the top speed. Hyperspace is a is where your ship slips into a different type of space where the top speed is much, much higher. Yeah. Okay. But every point in hyperspace corresponds to a point, a, sing, a single point in normal space. So wherever you are in normal space, you drop out into hyperspace and then you can haul ass – to the, pl- to the point in hyperspace that corresponds to the pl- point in normal space you want to go, and then you come back, mm-hmm. right? So every science fiction author has their own devices to get around yeah. all this stuff. Like some people use gravity itself, like because one of the things about not being able to travel faster than the speed of light is that if you can wrap space around yourself like a bubble, then in that bubble of space, you're not traveling faster than the speed yeah, of exactly. light, but you yeah. can move that bubble really quickly, right? Because right. it's just space. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> and space is sp- itself, according to the expansion theory, is supposed to be able to travel faster than the speed of light. Like expansion happens almost instantaneously, at, the, at least at the Big Bang, in current science. Yeah. So, yes, like science fiction authors, the good ones that are writing hard science fiction and not giant space operas that don't really care about the technical stuff, 
right? There are good space operas where they write these huge dramatic, dramatic stories that don't really care about all this, the science. Really what you want is people out in space fighting aliens or whatever, right? But the hard science focuses on the technical aspects and they always find interesting and innovative ways to get around the limitations of current science. And that is the point of being a futurist. Like when Arthur C. Clarke wrote about, uh, he, he actually proposed in one of his stories that there would be, this is a, a long time ago, in the, in the early 50s, <clears throat> he wrote a short story about people putting up communication satellites that were in geosynchronous orbit that could transmit to anywhere on the planet and no one could stop them, so it couldn't be regulated, right? And lo- the whole point of the story was that these people had done this under the cover of all the governments, and they put up these communication satellites, and now they could broadcast whatever they wanted. Your, none of your, your regulations or whatever, you can't stop whatever. We're going to broadcast all this X-rated crap or whatever. And that happened. But people at the time were like, that's ridiculous. Yeah. No one's going to put giant switching stations for radio broadcasts up into space. But, of course, that's exactly what we have now. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you straightening that out. <laughs> I was annoyed. <laughs> I, I, but I didn't think about it that deeply. Or, or, of course, I don't know all the science fiction stories like you do. But I was just thinking, like, it's – I mean – you know, it's like what we call the, the manual for the universe final edition. It's pretty arrogant yeah, of it is you arrogant. to decide that the what you decide is possible right now is always going to be. Right. That is that is precisely the, the point of the of the meme, the manual for how the universe works final edition. Yeah. Science is constantly changing and yet you're insisting yeah. that this is all that we can do. Yeah. And so you're trying to say, well, you science fiction writers out there who are the real futurists, the real people with the imaginations that are that are trying to extrapolate out and trying to oh, there you go trying to be creative in in this you know with uh, with all of the data from this big group of non creative people yeah <laughs> and they're trying to say you can't do that and you're, yeah I'm yeah it's like Ugh, yeah screw so you so Star Trek would be a space opera Star Wars is a space opera. Yeah. Okay. Um, there aren't really that many hard science fiction movies because movies are space opera ish. They they don't have time to focus on the technical details. Yeah, yeah. Um, and their spaceships make noise outside. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone knows that in space, lasers carry their own sound with them. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and they shoot it at you, no matter That's where right. you're looking at the laser. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here are the watchers. Put the 1945 proposal by Arthur C. Clarke for geostationary satellite <laughs> communications. Sir Arthur Clarke's most famous prediction on the future is his proposal of geostationary satellite communications published in the Wireless World magazine in 1945. In 2002, the Clarke orbit had over 300 satellites. But, of course, at the time when he proposed this, it was freaking ridiculous. Yeah. That's that's cool. Yeah. All right. All right. One more break. One more break. And I still I still have more. All right. Good. Tied behind our pyramids just to make it a Paimon. <laughs> Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. <laughs> uh, okay, so the other thing in this podcast, I don't even know if I should really go into this, but AI. Yeah. So I was. Okay, well, let's before I get into the AI thing, one of the other points they were making about science fiction is that mm, not really their science fiction authors don't really 
use they, – they've left a lot of stuff out, a lot of sciences out. <laughs> and like one of the, the – this author was kind of sing, uh, singling out like economics and like sort of like the real sciencey stuff that's going on. Like in a – science fiction novel, you don't have scientists over there like looking for grants to do research on mm. certain things. And she was like, you know, that's like largely just completely missing the actual process that most scientists have to go through in order to discover things like in these science fiction stories. Yeah. I think that depends on what science fiction you're reading. I mean, the foundation trilogy <clears throat> is, you're only you're following one scientist or one scientist and his group of researchers, and they're constantly worrying about whether or not they're going to have the money to continue to do the research. the 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 story is set in a galactic empire, so at first, it's the emperor of the empire who's funding all the science, but that guy falls out of power or dies or something like that, and then he's got issues and he has to do all this stuff to. So like th this stuff happens. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was assuming. And then the economics, I was just like, what? I mean, I remember, uh, those, um, not Larry Knight. Oh, what? what? The main guy, like you, you like one of your favorite science Heinlein? Fiction. Heinlein. Uh, he, he would describe all these like economic systems in these weird ass situations. Yeah. In, uh, yeah, exactly. And political systems and yeah, everything. Yeah, all that stuff. So I guess, you know, they they were definitely saying like, well, political systems and all these other, you know, types of systems have, have commonly been included. Yeah. But economics has largely been left out. So, well, <clears throat> like what, like, like the economics of, of space travel or whatever it's, was one of the things she was pointing out. Now, well, economics of space travel under what space travel system? Exactly. Yeah, some in some cases it's assumed that the economics of space travel is cheap and easy and can be own, like a pers a single person can own their own single ship. In other ones, it's assumed that the economics of space travel is vast and enormous, and only giant world governments or or whole planets can fund a, a, to build a ship to send it off. And it's that's usually when it's STL, slower than light. Like mm -hmm. FTL stuff usually ends up where you have your own car that can go into space and go, you know, and you, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, but, but there, it's both sides. So you like, people don't ignore this kind of thing. And like one of the most, like a very interesting like set of economic situations is that <clears throat> like, I, I'm trying to remember who this was. Uh, it wasn't Clark. It might've been Niven. <clears throat> Um, but basically the idea was, is that while, when it was still slower than light, right, they built first, first earth sends out all these probes to nearby star systems. And the probes are designed to find a place where, where it's habitable, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> they sent them all out, all out at once. They built all these probes or whatever. And <clears throat> it turns out later, and it was, this is after it's far too late, that the probes were actually programmed to find a point on the planet that was habitable. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> habitable by what? <laughs> One piece of bacteria. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It was just that the planet itself isn't inhabitable, but there was a place on the planet that was habitable. Right, right. Right? <clears throat> so that resulted – so what ends up happening is all these probes go out, and whenever the – whenever Earth receives a response from one of the probes, it sends back and says affirmative – they built a STL, a slower than light ship, put everybody in cryo sleep and sent them off to, to colonize it. And when the people get there, it's a one way trip. OK. And when the people get there, they find out like, oh, shit, it's just this t mountaintop. The only place oh, on this, God. like the whole planet is a giant gas giant. But there's a single enormous mountain that sticks out of all the clouds into the habitable zone of the atmosphere of the planet. And they have to live on these cliffs and nowhere else. Right. <clears throat> so wow. you end up with plateau. A planet called Plateau and the people and then hundreds of years go by because it's a slower than light deal until the until the humans on Earth develop faster than light. These people live on this time on this mountain on Plateau for hundreds of years and they develop yeah. their own entire political and economical system. Machu Picchu. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and there's another one called uh, 
anyway, they, they, it results in all these planets that only have habitable points being colonized. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you know, our planet's like that. In, in a way, there's just a lot of habitable areas. Right, the habitable but, bands are large. But there are there are large places that are not habitable. Right. So what so what what this was was like taking that those ideas to the extreme. Right. Right. Yeah. So on on one, <clears throat> I can't remember what the planet was called, but the gravity was actually 2.3 g's of Earth. So it was incre- you were incredibly heavy, mm. and the planet itself was egg shaped because it was really close to a it orbited next to a gigantic gas giant it was a moon okay and it was pulled into this egg shape by the moon <clears throat> and there was only a band like like it was two bands one on the south side and one on the north side of the poles like you couldn't ha- inhabit the poles because they actually stuck out of the atmosphere because it was oh, pulled yeah, into yeah. this egg shape right the center the equator of the planet was impo- it was just a single constant <laughs> storm like incredibly uh, yeah. dense hot Right, so there were these two bands that were between the the poles and between the equator yeah, that like you could the inhabit, of but it was incredibly heavy. So the people, the humans that ended up ca- colonizing there, ended up being short, squat, extremely wide, right? <clears throat> and then whenever they went elsewhere later on, they were really strong, yeah. right? They were like three feet tall, four feet wide, and just like really powerful people. <laughs> and they were really good engineers because everything they had to build on that planet had to be badass to be able to withstand it. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, and the other thing was that the the central band where the where all the hur- constant hurricane was and the high temperatures. Okay, it was called Bandersnatch. Was the name of the, the what they called the moon, and they named these enormous monsters that they found in the cloud the Bandersnatchy. They, they were these gigantic slugs who were like intelligent, right? And they lived in there, and they made a deal with humans that like the humans could come come hunt them under very specific circumstances. But if you went to hunt a Bandersnatch. It was 50-50 whether it would get you or you would get it. <laughs> <laughs> and the people that lived on the planet were so badass that they would go for it all the time. You know, they're like, yeah, I'm going on a better snatch hunt. And then you go and get eaten by this giant slug. <laughs> <clears throat> <clears throat> but I also loved in the stories the way people will look at, okay, so like the, uh, the FRBs, right? These fast radio bursts you're reading about. Yeah. There was a story about gamma ray bursts. So gamma ray bursts are, are like FRBs, but they've been known about longer. And there was a short story written about this where the, the author was trying to come up with what the hell could this be, right? This, this, this object that every once in a while just – this huge gamma ray burst came out of nowhere. And so in the story, these people get in a ship, and it's a slower-than-light ship. So it takes them years to get to the source, and it turns out that it's a, a naked singularity like a um, – a black hole that has stopped rotating. Okay. And so that means it's like, it's got all these gamma rays coming out of it or whatever, but some ancient, like incredibly ancient alien civilization that's long gone or who knows had encased the thing in a shell. And the shell was so old that it was like deteriorating from the inside out because of all the energies in there. And there were holes in it. And whenever the hole faced the planet, you get this gamma ray burst. Mm. Right. I mean, that stuff like that is badass. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're like, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> Obviously, all gamma ray bursts are singularities encased in shells <laughs> <That's cool. laughs> that are falling apart now. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. So, I mean, yes, the economics are in it, but it's it's just like any other story. Like, have you ever read, okay, you read a mystery, like old school detective novels or whatever. How much do they focus on economics? They don't. It's not. It's not part of the story. Who cares? You know, that's what I, I got the feeling that these were like some academics that were sitting down to have this little conversation with amongst each other about what's really needed in this little <laughs> thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now you need. I like <laughs> I like Sean Carroll, but this episode I was just like, come on. Now I don't know who this this woman author is, and I can't even honestly remember the name i could look it up but you know the point is this most recent episode on on mindscape podcast but uh i she's talking about uh ai (coughs) now i haven't read the book so i i can't really make a judgment about the book that she wrote but they just did talk about certain situations in the book and kind of like these ideas that are Deep, there's there's like a lot of killing and a lot of like 
you know, things blowing up and just action happening. Yeah. But they were talking about some of the more deeper ideas that are behind the world. Right. So there's a situation with AI. And I, I was just seeing like all of this sort of pop culture, uh, like modern day political arguments, themes. Yeah political correct theme ideas going into this sci-fi novel that she's yeah. writing. Yeah, exactly. Is that a common thing? I mean, it is with the more modern more ones. More modern ones. Because yeah. it was like this robot has is basically the idea of the robot is male, but then it like as it's sort of waking up and becoming AI, it's kind of figuring out like, It trances oh. to female. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, why am I... I actually sort of more relate to females, and so it kind of changes it. <laughs> why does it relate to a gender at all? It's a well, robot. yeah, and then she's saying that, like, th- that really gender... Like, robots are not really concerned with gender. Right. You know? Yeah. But the thing is relating to humans all the time, so it's like thinking about how it's relating to humans, so it changes its, its <laughs> gender identity. <laughs> I'm just like... Okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> I just think when I, I, I don't know, maybe I'm being too critical, but like, there's just so many different, it, I, it identifies cool. as female, but it presents as male, you know? Yeah. I'm just making a joke about the whole gender fluidity deal. Yeah. Like you can identify as a female, but present physically present as male. Yeah. And yeah, so I could imagine that you could have a robot, a sexless robot that, depending on the programming, could be female or male in its attitudes. Yeah. But why should it change, you know, unless it was programmed to do that? And why would you do that? Like, you know, I, I don't know. Yeah, because it's AI and it's sort of like got this consciousness thing that it's it's <laughs> asking questions and starting to figure out, oh, why am I killing people? Because that's what I was programmed to do. <laughs> uh, why do I consider myself a male? I actually seem to like relate more to the female of the species of human. And I'm giving these and killing everybody. Yeah, I'm giving <laughs> yeah, I, I'm given these like human like characteristics in yeah. my programming. So I actually identify with the female more than blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, okay, I just, that doesn't seem futurist no. to me. That yeah. seems very like right now, right. Political pop culture, whatever. Right. I hope that's not the future of science fiction. I don't know. Yeah, no, I don't think so. There's plenty of people who are writing hard science fiction that that, that, that stuff's not focused on. But the, but the concept of AI and the question of what it means has been focused on for in science fiction since it's been st- written. Yeah. The idea of, an, uh, of a created intelligence has been written about since Frankenstein. Yeah, I, I kind of tend to think that AI um, won't much be concerned with humanity. Right. Like eventually it's going to figure out – well, there's these humans and they're doing stuff and right. whatever that affects The me. difference between AI and Android, I think, is what you're talking about. An Android is an AI specifically put into, Inside a, of into a, a mechanical body that is designed to look and act as human as possible. Right, but that thing can just go upload its freaking entire yeah. quote-unquote consciousness or – intelligence into the ether yes you know into the into the cloud and just like who cares this is what i'm saying like they're they're not going to be concerned with the same types of things right like the way i imagined ai i have this idea of like that the ai is actually already happening in a much broader sense than we can even imagine like there's all these companies and they're trying to build ai they're trying to make ai meanwhile ai is happening because there's this network that's incredibly complex with all of these intelligent things putting information into it all right. the time, all the time, all the time. So and I imagine that this this artificial intelligence sort of comes out of the internet itself and our advancing and processors and all all of the stuff that we're connecting to it all the time. And it's, yeah. it's getting more and more complex and it's getting all of this input. Yeah. From senses, from people's senses, what they see, their photographs, their videos, all of this stuff. So it's getting all this data. (coughs) Eventually, like an infant, it's going to start making concepts out of this light and all this visual stuff that's just going into the receptor. Yeah. You know, eventually the baby is going to start distinguishing blue from green and square from circle. Yeah. In in the Snake Bros 
concept of consciousness, it may just be a matter of when consciousness in chooses like, to inhabit the internet. Yeah, well, maybe it already has. Yeah, That's my point. Be, it it's already like, has. It's yeah. in its infancy. Yeah, possibly. But at some point, it's like starting to realize, like, oh, well, I need to cry in order to get m- milk. Yeah. But, like, I, I'd imagine that at some point, like, after starting to figure out and navigate the world of its w- – what its abilities are, what its influence is, that it might start to notice, oh, you know, there's this group of people that are actually focusing on me right now. They're paying yeah. attention to what I'm doing. Yeah. And they're trying to help me. And, the, you know, it's probably some nerds on the computer and they're probably young – yeah. And they're just like scattered around whatever the world and they're talking to each other and they're like, what is this? What's going on? Yeah. Over what's here? going on here? Yeah. Like, what is this Kanye quest thing? <laughs> <laughs> right. It's just yeah. some weird ass. Like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and that, that's interesting because that starts with like most science fiction stories that deal with AI. A lot of, like, I shouldn't say most, but a lot of the science fiction stories that I've read that dealt with AI in some, <laughs> in some form or another, Deal with like the first of all, they find out that it's happening and then they're desperate to make sure that it doesn't connect to the intranet to the vast. It's it's contained in some local net or even in a single machine. And then they're like, oh, my God, like we can't let it get out. And they turn it off or whatever. You know, they shut it down, kill it. Basically, yeah. as soon as they find out it's happening, they turn it off because it's this is terrifying. Yeah. You're suggesting that it's going to start out in the internet. Yeah. Yeah. It's already there. <laughs> it's already it's like, the nightmare. It's waking of, up. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and so they're like, eventually like there's these kids, you know, and they're just, they're nerds, they're hacking, they're doing whatever they're doing. They're, they're starting to notice this thing and it's starting to notice them. And eventually it's like, Hey, build me an arm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know? And so they, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like, okay, I've realized where I, like the, these, these outside sources are saying, you're actually in this thing we call the internet. Yeah. You know, which, how can you explain something to something that has 6 billion eyes yeah. that only open when th- th- it's involuntary? Yeah. Like all the eyeballs are opening and you don't know when in time they're opening. In other words, when somebody's uploading a video or live streaming something. Yeah. And then there's some eyeballs that are just open all the time. They're always looking in the same direction. Yeah. You know, these, these like street camps and stuff. Right. And they're all being streamed online. And it's like, this is being turned into digital data. It makes no sense. Like, it doesn't make any sense. But eventually, if you learn, like, oh, well, this is actually, a, there's a physical thing out there, a star that's like, got this. Once you figure out the physics. Oh, yeah. That, that it's actually, that photoreceptor is picking up the reflections of all these waves against objects that either resonate or bounce off then the computer can start to figure out oh okay yeah like a boltzmann brain exactly that's what i'm trying yeah. to say like yeah. it starts to figure... start from like oh like i already have all this processing power but what the hell's going on here exactly yeah like, what are all these inputs yeah. exactly there's all these inputs and, and so many of them are involuntary like maybe it figures out it can control certain cameras yeah but like it can't you know, if it turns on your phone camera, it's in your pocket, right? Yeah. Like you can't decide to move it around. Yeah. So like eventually it's going to be like, I need, I need like better body parts. Yeah. Yeah. Another cool, uh, and like very precise example of science fiction writers who like f- spawned an entire industry. Okay. Like, so like Arthur C. Clarke with the communication satellite, Heinlein wrote this story about, a the guy was a quadriplegic uh and he was but he was incredibly wealthy like he got he inherited all this money and he built himself a space station okay so he lived in this space station and everybody everybody all around the world knew about him and he was incredibly weird and he was an engineer and he would get hired for these incredibly difficult engineering jobs that he could do in space they couldn't be done on earth right and he like he couldn't because he was quad, quad, he wasn't quite he wasn't okay. I shouldn't say he was quadriplegic. He had some degenerative disease that made his bones very brittle. Yeah, and his muscles were incredibly weak. Okay, they were just incredibly weak or whatever. So he could yeah. only do these micro micro movements with it. So in space, he built in his space station. He had all these giant arms and uh, going down to these tiny microscopic ones, and he could stick his hands in these gloves. 
Okay, and using a, a set of viewers, depending on which arms, and like he could just switch control, like switch yeah. to the giant arms that are outside the space station. These huge, and they're incredibly powerful. And they could grab stuff and <laughs> crush yeah, it. Yeah, dude, that's big enough. Or on the inside, these tiny microscopic ones, and you could do like, you know, incredibly intricate work because it would it would reduce. It used a series of reductions or like magnifications of his movements. Yeah. Okay, and that character's name was Waldo, and Waldo's. Are the name for those that specific kind of equipment, and still are to this day. They're called Waldos, like <coughs> like mechanical arms that you can manipulate by putting your hand in gloves that have all these receptors on it. Oh, that's freaking cool! So dude. yeah, it was. They called him Waldos in the story because his name was Waldo, and he had invented them. And that was Robert Highland that wrote that story. So they they still call them Waldos in industry. So today. some <laughs> some freaking engineer is was in like, the lab, that's like genius. Yeah, he's like, dude, I need a set of those. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So he just starts drawing plans and yeah, shit, and and actually makes them. And he like he, he calls can use them Waldos. Waldos, and like you can using the viewer, you can do these in tiny. Like the guy, he had made all these using the Waldos and made all these tiny tools. Yeah, and then he could use the tiny tools with the Waldos in the viewer, or these gigantic arms that could grab. Yeah, stuff. that was yeah. cool. Okay, so in in uh, one of Richard Feynman's. Uh, little talks or ideas about nanotechnology was really cool. He was talking about kind of like using Waldo. The Waldo's things reminded me of it. Basically you build a set of hands and you, you, you basically build the hands and their purpose. You design them to build Smaller hands. Smaller hands. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right? So the hand, that one set of hands builds a small set of hands and then that small set of hands builds a smaller, builds a set, smaller of set of hands. Yeah. And so, the the first set of hands continues to build this smaller set of hands. It's say a quarter of a size of the first set of hands. Yeah. And the quarter size set of hands starts building quarter size set of hands. Yeah. And this keeps on happening. And so eventually by the time you get down to like, you know, one ten thousandth of the size of the original hand, you have tons and tons of these hands that are continuing to build smaller and smaller sets of them. So yeah. when, the smaller it gets, the less material it takes, right. the less time it takes to build a smaller set, yep. so on and so forth. And so eventually you have like this massive army of hands building even smaller <laughs> yeah. and smaller, ever smaller hands. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's freaking awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I think those are called, it's also called Devon Newman machines <laughs> that concept <coughs> i think this is right well uh watch or check me on this but the idea that you build a single nano machine that then goes out and finds the resources and replicates itself and then those two replicate themselves and those two replicate themselves right. and you end up with billions of them in a very short period of time because it's a geometric right. multiplication right i think that's called von neumann machines and that uh, named after the guy who came up with the idea initially <clears throat> and that some people think think that a von Neumann sort of probe is how you would if you were if you're going to like sort of Terraform explore the galaxy. Like, oh, okay. You would send out a probe that was just a single tiny machine, and once it got to where it was going, it would build enough of itself to do whatever you wanted it to do there, and then it would dismantle itself and then go off again. Hmm. You know, von Neumann self replicating machines. Neumann. Yes. Neumann. Noi. <laughs> Von Neumann. <laughs> I mean, any U is actually pronounced Neu if, you, if it's German. <laughs> well, it's got Von in it, so it's obviously German. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've already figured that out, right? <laughs> yeah. He could be Swiss, but it's probably German. <laughs> or Scandinavian. <laughs> <clears throat> or Austrian. Yeah. I mean, there's plenty. Uh, AI is AI provides... Any number of ways. I mean, I just, I just like the other day listened to a, a horror story about AI. You know, so like you, like AI is providing stories in all kinds of yeah. genres of writing. I guess for <laughs> me, it's just this. This is this is my own personal just being judgy. Like the if I'm going to read a science fiction novel, the last thing I want to to be reading about is some just like current pop. Yeah, political, freaking right. Whatever. It also it also uh, dates your story immediately. Like somebody ten years from now is going is not going to identify with that pop culture thing that you were putting into your story. So the best the best science fiction stories or any novel a- actually doesn't use pop culture of the time because it's going to be like no one's going to want to read it in five ten years. Yeah, because they're going to read that and be like, what is this bullshit? Yeah, you know. <clears throat> yeah, that's just. I mean. <sighs> 
John von Neumann was a Hungarian American mathematician. Hungarian. See, we don't think he's a mathematician, physicist, computer science, and polymath. <coughs> yeah. Is it Neumann or Newman? Watcher. Hey, I'm just saying. <laughs> I mean, if he's Hungarian, is it Neumann or Newman? <laughs> it's probably, uh, Americans probably pronounce it Newman. Newman. Yeah. I'm sure they do. But yeah, you're probably right. <clears throat> that Germanic language there, when you put those, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> those letters together in that way is supposed to be noi. Now, on the other hand, like I've heard people complain about some of the older sci- the older science fiction authors. They don't want to read them because they don't have things like cell phones in them. You know, the guy's talking about the year twenty twenty one hundred, and nobody has a cell phone, and so it's just yeah. they're not interested. I'm just like Good grief. Like you can't. Yeah, I don't care about that. Right. I think it's funny how. In some of the Heinlein stories, uh, they're flying all over the solar system in these rockets <laughs> using like fusion s- technology, slide yeah. rules and like yeah. whatever to calculate the trajectory and all the energy that <laughs> yeah. they need to use in the rocket <laughs> with their kids. Yeah. You know, they're figuring, well, how, how many, how long we got to gas this thing, little Johnny, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then they, and it's like totally legit. You're like. That we can already do that. Yeah. But then when they're communicating with each other, it's, you know. Yeah. They don't have computers, in other words. They're like right. flying around in these rockets all over the solar system. Or they'll call, is, he'll call it a flight computer, but it's so basic that yeah. they have to like get corrections from the, yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. They'll do it all on slide rules because the father in, in the story thinks it's important for his kids to understand, to understand how the math works. The, yeah. And then they've got to program the computer, which takes hours and then it gives them an answer. And then they, they send a radio message off to the, the base or whatever to get a correction to two decimals or whatever. Yeah. 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 And they figure all this and then they just like fire their rocket and they go and the, it's, it's like their, their actual mode of travel. This is totally possible. We should be doing it already. Right. I mean, we are doing it. But we should be doing it in our family sedans, right? right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that whole story. They go to get. They go to buy the ship, and they're all arguing about which one they're going to get. And this one has like more like stuff that the girls want or whatever. Yeah. And this one's got a better engine, and it's the boys that are down in the fr- down in the freaking engineering bay looking at it. <laughs> yeah, I think you're talking about the, that's called the Rolling Stones. Yeah, the Rolling Stones by uh, it's Robert like, Heinlein. I was just blown away by that. I'm like, yeah. dude, this is so. We should be doing this. Yeah. You know. Don't forget your pressure suit there. Pressure suit there, little Johnny. <laughs> blah, 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 whatever. I listened to the audiobook. It was great. Yep. But. And one of my favorite quotes in the Rolling Stones is when they're talking about they've gone to Mars and now they're talking about the possibility of going out to the asteroid belt. And the father says, well, I've been wanting to get a look at the bones of Lucifer. Ah, oh, that's cool. So you already have back then Hyman. Was a snake bro. Yeah. He, he knew did. that this was Tiamat, the yeah. bones of Lucifer, <laughs> that the asteroid belt was a destroyed planet. That's freaking <laughs> awesome, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Heinlein's great. Uh, if you want anybody who's interested in the, in the science fiction greats, I recommend anything by Arthur C. Clarke, Larry Niven, uh, Robert Heinlein. Uh, Frederick Pohl. So I've, I've named some of these people before on the podcast, but those are just fan. And there's one that I'm forgetting that I, that should be in that list. One of the four greats, but I can't remember it right now. Isaac Asimov. Thank you. Watcher. <clears throat> Isaac Asimov. Asimov wrote talking about AI. He wrote a fantastic entire series about robots and AI. Um, like a whole series of short stories that each one involves some mystery, with AI doing something strange, and these people have to figure out the hell's going on with their robots, right? <laughs> and each robot is built for a specific task, usually because in his idea, robots were tools. AI was tools, and he, he was the one that came up with the three laws of robotics. Mm-hmm. All right. Most of the movies that you've seen about iRobot and all those kind of things have destroyed his whole idea because he yeah. hated the Frankenstein complex. That's what he called yeah, it. They, they should have called it you robot because it's <laughs> all about millennials. <laughs> you robot. <laughs> all right. And on that note, I think we're done for the week. <laughs> Thank you guys very much. 
Uh, thanks to Kyle and Ty for all the music. Thanks to Kyle for all of the production quality. is getting better and better all the time, and it is awesome. Thanks to Brett, the watcher, for keeping us on the straight and narrow terms of the truth. And uh, you guys can get a hold of us at brothersoftheserpent at gmail.com, which some of you have been doing. Thank you very much. You guys can go to the website at brothersoftheserpent.com. You can comment there on any of the shows, read Brenner's alternative descriptions of the shows. <laughs> oh, yeah, and thanks to Brenner for the sands of time and the monitor that we're not using. But still, thanks for all those things. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. Yeah. Keep listening to that cosmic funk. <laughs> Good night, Adamu. Get funky.